Good to go, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our hearing today at EDC. We will be co-chairing with our Francisco Moya, the council member from Land Use, who should be here any minute. Also, council member Richards is, uh, been a leader on the FRESH program in the past, and we're looking forward to his cooperation, help, and assistance on this. So today we will be assessing the zoning and financial incentives of the food retail expansion to support health programs, so we're going to start our hearing. So welcome to the EDC. Today is Thursday, June 14th, 2018. My name is Councilmember Paul Vallone, and I have the privilege of co-chairing this hearing along with my fellow council member, Francisco Moyer, chair of the Subcommittee of Zoning and Franchises. I'd like to extend my special thanks to Councilmember Moyer as well as Councilmember Richards and the other members of the committee to helping us prepare for today. The purpose of today's hearing is to review the financial and zoning incentives offered by the Industrial Development Corporation and the Department of City Planning, respectively, which together make up the Food Retail Expansion to Support Health Program, also known as FRESH. The FRESH program was born in 2009 out of a desire to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to supermarkets and fresh, healthy food. The incentives offered as part of the program are primarily to supermarket operators and real estate developers in order to ensure that fresh food is available in the areas of the city that need it most. The supermarket should be a critical component of any neighborhood, and this ambitious program was created to make it easier for supermarkets to thrive in areas of the city with limited food access options. The initial creation of the FRESH program was through an interagency effort between the Council and the Economic Development Corporation, Department of City Planning, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. The areas where FRESH incentives are available were determined through that interagency effort and based primarily on the so-called Supermarket Needs Index developed by the Department of City Planning that identified high-need areas based on several relevant indicators. These indicators range from population density to prevalence of obesity and diabetes to the ratio of fresh food retailers to all food retailers, among several others which we will discuss further today. Since then, the administration has partnered with the council to discuss amendments to both the financial and zoning incentives offered through the FRESH program, and we applaud that work that has been done so far to deepen these incentives in productive and meaningful ways. I would be remiss if we did not acknowledge the work done by Councilmember Donovan Richards last session as chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises and head of the FRESH Task Force, which set out to amend and improve the FRESH program in real time. Despite the substantial work done by our colleagues at the Council and within the administration over the last decade, however, this is the first time since its creation that the FRESH program has a dedicated Council hearing to evaluate its progress, and we hope this hearing provides a forum for an open and candid discussion on the merits of several proposals to expand the FRESH program through both its tax and zoning incentive offerings. Currently, the Industrial Development Corporation, IDC, administers the FRESH Financial Incentive Program, which offers three types of benefits to eligible grocery stores. The first is a building tax reduction based on the real estate tax of the property before FRESH improvements begin, or a full land tax abatement for new construction. Either of these incentives are available for up to 25 years, with a phase-out period beginning in year 21. The second incentive is a sales tax waiver of the 8.875% city and state sales tax for materials used to construct, renovate, or equip supermarket facilities. And the third incentive is a reduction of the mortgage recording tax from 2.8% to 0.3% for mortgages on eligible projects. It is important to note that all of these incentives are offered through the IDA's discretionary funding, and any interested supermarket operator or developer also needs to be in fresh, eligible neighborhoods as a prerequisite to any approval. Notably, the IDA did amend its universal tax exemption policy last year to streamline this process for interested parties. We look forward to hearing testimony from EDC and IDA of the effects of this new policy and what impact it is having on FRESH applications, as well as expanding the areas that may be eligible for FRESH. I know Chair Moyer is also eager to discuss the zoning incentives offered as part of FRESH, so we will defer to him when Chair Moyer um, is, makes it at this point. Before we turn it over to him, I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Richards for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Vallone, and I want to thank Chair Moyer uh, for holding this hearing today. Uh, my name is Donovan Richards. I was formerly the chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchi Franchises, and I'm here today to provide some background on the work from last session on FRESH. 
During the review process for mandatory inclusionary housing, the mayoral administration made a commitment to studying fresh food access and the efficiency of the FRESH program. Nearly 10 years since the program's creation, it's time to see what adjustments can be made to ensure the program is as effective as possible, including the expansion of zoning benefits to attract new supermarkets to areas that have been left behind to date. To that end, the City of Council established a FRESH task force, which was convened in spring 2016. I led this task force in the City Council's legislation finance and land use divisions participated. The task force met with representatives from City Hall, EDC, DCP, and the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, as well as several advocacy groups to discuss a variety of potential solutions that would address issues faced by supermarket operators and different real estate markets. A few of the ideas discussed included expanding the, expanding the geographies for the zoning and financial incentives of the FRESH program, considering commercial overlays on NYCHA property to allow for the construction of supermarkets and programmatic offerings such as the expansion of fresh food box programs and an SBS help desk for supermarket operators. In the years that followed the creation of fresh, more grocery stores faced new pressures due to rising real estate values and commercial rent increases. In other areas such as the Rockaways in my district, the area does not have the fresh zoning incentives. The Rockaways are in an underserved neighborhood that would benefit from all available incentives to bring f fresh food supermarkets to the area. I look forward to hearing the proposals today and to seeing how the FRESH program can be, approved, can, can be improved to ensure food access in low and moderate income areas. I want to turn it back over to the chairs, but thank them uh, for certainly holding uh, a hearing on this important subject. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our Economic Development Committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polanoff, Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson, Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali, as well as the Council's team in the Land Use Division, Director Raju Mann, Policy Analyst Rebecca Crimmins, and Project Manager Chelsea Kelly for their hard work putting this hearing together, as well as my Chief of Staff Jonathan Shutt, my De uh, Deputy Chief of Staff Ahmed Nazar, and my Legislative Director Michael Young. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Council members that are present, Peter Koo, uh, Council Members Rivera, Torres, and Adams. So, um, as soon, what we'll do is, as soon as uh, Council Member Moyer comes, I think what we could do is have start with the testimony from EDC, to, and then one, we'll turn it over to have an opening for Council Member Moyer. Sound like a plan? So let's swear in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony, and to respond honestly to the Council Members' questions? Thank you. You can introduce and start your testimony. Uh, good morning, Chair Vallone and the Committee on Economic Development and Fr Zoning and Franchises. My name is Jennifer Gravel. I'm the Director of the Housing, Economic, and Infrastructure Planning Division at the Department of City Planning. I appreciate this opportunity to provide an overview of the zoning incentives provided through the food retail expansion to support health or fresh program. I'm joined today by Krishna Omaladi from EDC's Strategic Investments Group, who will speak to the city's fresh financial incentive programs. Um, as you know, Fresh was developed in response to a citywide study conducted by the Department of City Planning called Going to Market. This was released in 2008, and what this highlighted was really a widespread shortage in neighborhood grocery stores providing fresh food in several communities in New York City. Um, and the FRESH program was really one of many interventions that uh, was created to offer zoning incentives and financial benefits in these underserved communities. Uh, the goal of the program is to encourage development and retention of convenient accessible stores that provide fresh meat, fruits and vegetables and other perishable goods in addition to a really a full line of grocery products. But the program is, it offers incentive zoning incentives that provide additional floor area in mixed buildings. It reduces the amount of parking required for food stores and permits larger grocery stores than what's permitted as of right in our light manufacturing districts. The financial benefits which are administered by uh, the Industrial Development Agency exempts or reduces certain taxes for, for stores that qualify as fresh food stores. The program is currently applica applicable in shopping districts in selected neighborhoods where there is a demonstrated shortage of grocery stores and a higher incidence of uh, health-related disease. Uh, these areas encompass portions of Manhattan's community mm -hmm. districts 9 through 12, 
Bronx Community Districts 1 through 7. Uh, portions of Bronx Community Districts 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 16, and 17, and portions of Community District 12, the Special Downtown Jamaica District, and Houts Point in Queens. A developer seeking to utilize the zoning incentives of the FRESH program must demonstrate that the primary business of the retail space is the sale of food products. Prior to obtaining a building permit for the development, the proposed store must be certified by the Department of City Planning as a fresh food store verifying that it meets certain floor area requirements, selling space is dedicated to fresh food, um, and that the space is legally committed to use as a fresh food store. Um, and also that the grocer has agreed to operate a fresh food store in the, play, in the space. And the specific requirements uh, to, to qualify for the zoning benefits are that, that you must have at least 6,000 square feet of selling area, of the store must be dedicated, dedicated to grocery selling area, and of that selling area, 50% must be used for a general line of food products, um, and then no less than 30% of that floor area must be set aside for perishable goods, such as fresh food, fresh, fresh fruit, fresh meat, uh, frozen foods, and no less than 500 square feet must be used for fresh meat, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, we also, the, the program also requires that a percentage of the ground floor street wall of a fresh store must be glazed and transparent to contribute to a more active streetscape. In addition, all certified fresh food stores must also display the fresh sign at the entrance to the store indicating participation in the fresh program and that fresh foods are sold inside. A development would be permitted one additional square foot of residential floor area in a mixed building for every square foot of a fresh food store that's provided up to a maximum of 20,000 square feet. The City Planning Commission may also, by authorization, allow an increase in the maximum building height up to 15 feet to accommodate the additional floor area in districts where we have height limits. In light manufacturing districts, fresh food stores with up to 30,000 square feet would be permitted as of right. Currently, any stores over 10,000 square feet would, would be required to have a City Planning Commission special permit. So this, this rule allows a larger store if you qualify as a fresh food store. Uh, parking requires, requirements are also relaxed in some zoning districts that have been in, for, for qualifying fresh food stores. In M1 and C8 districts, the first 15,000 square feet of floor area in a food store is exempt from the minimum parking requirements. And in our C1 through C6 districts, which are many of our neighborhood retail corridors, fresh food stores with less than 40,000 square feet of floor area do not have to provide parking. There are some exceptions to these reductions. They do not apply in portions of Manhattan Community District 12, in Bronx Community District 17, I'm sorry, Bronx Community District 7, Brooklyn Community Districts 5, 16, and 17, and the Special Downtown Jamaica District. The program requires, requires a continuing commitment to operate a fresh food store. However, in the unlikely event that a food store becomes economically not viable on a particular site, the space may be converted to another use, but only by authorization of the City Planning Commission or certification by the chairperson. The zoning and tax incentives are a modest program facilitating new stores in underserved parts of the city. Since its inception, the FRESH program has resulted in approximately 15 approvals with one application that's currently in public review. Average store size has been modest, just above 13,000 square feet. City planning com completed data analysis on the potential effect of, its, of the program since its adoption in 2009 as well as an overall analysis of the food retail landscape in New York City by comparing population changes in store closings and openings between 2007 and 2016. We created a series of maps that showed the locations of all the supermarkets in the city. In general, our findings were that most community districts have actually seen an increase in the supermarket square footage since 2007. In some cases, population growth outpaced that increase in supermarket square footage. This is true in uh, Bronx, Bronx Community District 5, Brooklyn Districts 2, 3, 6, 7, 13, and 16, Manhattan Districts 5, 7, and 10, Queens Community Districts 1, 2, and 4, and Staten Island Community District 3. A handful of districts really had no significant change in either population or supermarket square footage. This is true in Manhattan Community District 12, Communes, uh, Queens Community District 5 and 13, and Brooklyn Community District 18. 
the remainder and the majority of the community districts in the city had an increase in supermarket square footage to population. In most cases, neighborhoods see more but smaller stores over what they had in 2007. The analysis did not show an, uh, an, any evidence of clustering of supermarket losses or of any particular neighborhood in the city experiencing what we would consider an exodus of stores. Uh, the FRESH program has succeeded in providing some stores, but it's, it's clear that there, a need still remains. One of the most effective ways to increase the FRESH participation in underserved communities is for elected officials and community partners to advocate for the program and to also help us to make sure when they hear news of redevelopment that you're able to connect the, those developers to uh, potential operators of a store. Staff at, at the Department of City Planning always work closely with applicants to navigate the approval process and coordinate with our partners at EDC on, on complementary financial incentives. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today about the FRESH program, and we look forward to hearing from you on other ways to improve the program. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Vallone and Moya and the Committees on Economic Development and Zoning and Franchises. My name is Christian Omaladi, and I am an Assistant Vice President in the Strategic Investments Group with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, as well as Deputy Executive Director of the New York City Industrial Development Agency, also known as the IDA. I appreciate this opportunity to provide an overview of the financial incentives provided through the Food Retail Expansion to Support Health, or FRESH, program. Fresh financial incentives are administered by the IDA, a public benefit corporation formed under the New York State General Municipal Law and Public Authorities Law. The IDA is staffed by employees from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, but has a separate legal existence and an independent board. The mission of the IDA is to encourage economic, thank you. The mission of the IDA is to encourage economic development throughout the five boroughs, preserve existing jobs, and create and attract new, well-paying ones. IDA programs provide companies with tax benefits that enable the businesses to purchase real estate, construct or renovate facilities, and acquire equipment. All applicants must satisfy eligibility requirements and demonstrate a need for assistance. We conduct due diligence on all projects seeking assistance. This due diligence includes an analysis of the economic impact to the city of providing incentives for the project, a review of the applicant's employment practices, a background check of company principals, and a review of the environmental impact of the project. Fresh projects seeking financial assistance are legally required to be presented during a public hearing. A notice of the hearing is published at least 30 days prior, and the economic impact analysis, application, and environmental assessment form are posted to the IDA website at least two weeks before the hearing. After the hearing is complete, projects are presented to the IDA Board of Directors for their review. Approval by the IDA Board is necessary to provide fresh financial incentives. Fresh benefits are discretionary. They seek to address the challenges related to financing the cost of acquiring property for new and existing supermarkets and the operational expenses of running a supermarket. These benefits are designed to influence where grocery store operators put their stores and encourage developers to choose to locate in underserved, low-income neighborhoods. Recipients of fresh incentives benefit by saving on property taxes through stabilizing the assessed value of their building at a pre-improvement level and abating the property taxes attributed to the value of the land. In addition, the city and state sales tax of 8.875% on materials used to construct, renovate, or equip facilities is waived. Finally, recipients are able to reduce their mortgage recording tax from 2.8% to 0.3%, which saves on upfront closing costs. In order to be eligible for fresh benefits, a project must take place in a census tract with a poverty rate above 20% and an unemployment rate that is at least 25% more than the state average. Through the use of a fresh eligibility map, decisions about supermarket projects in a census tract are informed by economic data as well as the current number of existing supermarkets in areas with inadequate supermarket space. In addition to being located in an eligible area, stores must provide a minimum of 5,000 square feet of retail space for food and non-food grocery items intended for home preparation, consumption, and utilization. At least 50% of the retail space must be dedicated towards the those food items, and at least 30% of the space 
must be used for perishable goods such as dairy, fresh produce, meats, poultry, and fish. Finally, at least 500 square feet must be set aside for the sale of fresh produce. In 2017, the IDA reevaluated the eligibility criteria for the FRESH program in order to include more stores. The minimum store size was reduced from 6,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. FRESH program recipients are now eligible for a full land tax abatement, and developers can apply for the benefit in addition to the supermarket operator. Overall, in this current fiscal year, when the changes were officially adopted, the IDA has closed on five supermarket projects. These five projects are a significant increase from the one project which closed with the IDA in the previous two fiscal years. Since 2009, the FRESH program has provided incentives to 22 stores throughout New York City, 15 of which are now completed and open to the public. Those 22 projects translate to the retention of 600 jobs and the creation of over 1,100 new ones. It has spurred more than $128 million in private investment and created or renovated more than 680,000 square feet of space. One of our most successful projects is SuperFi Emporium in, Har in East Harlem. SuperFi has used fresh benefits to build two stores in the neighborhood. These locally owned and immigrant founded supermarkets will bring 25,000 square feet of fresh produce and high quality food to a historically underserved area and will create and retain 80 full-time equivalent jobs. The FRESH program has also enabled the construction of a 19,000 square foot Cherry Valley supermarket in the Williamsbridge section of the Bronx. The Cherry Valley, which is scheduled to open later this summer, will bring a supermarket to an area lacking in supermarket space and will create 80 new full-time equivalent jobs. We are proud of the impact the FRESH program has on local communities. We look forward to continuing our working relationship with the grocery industry and the city council and bringing more stores to underserved areas. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, both of you, for your testimony. We've been joined by Council Members Williams and Menchaca, and now I'd like to turn over to Chair Moyer for a discussion on the zoning incentives offered as part of FRESH. We'd like to defer to him on the discussion of the benefits offered through the zoning and the Department of Zoning and Planning, um, and especially since he's been an advocate for this for quite some time. Thank you. Councilman Moyer. Thank you, Chair Vallone, and first let me apologize. It, it, it is graduation season, uh, so it's uh, always tough. I know a lot of people think it was the World Cup, but my team doesn't play until 2 o'clock, so if we can wrap it up before then, I think we'll all be good. Uh, thank you, Chair Vallone. Uh, I want uh, to welcome everyone. I'm uh, Francisco Moy. I'm the Chair of the, Committee on Zoning, the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, um, and today, uh, we are here to listen to the hearings. It's titled Fresh, Assessing the Zoning and uh, Financial Incentives of the Food Retail Expansion to Support Health Programs. Uh, I'd like to recognize the members of the subcommittee who are here today, uh, Chair Adams, Minchaca, Torres, uh, Chair Rivera, Ku, uh, Council Member Richards. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, at this hearing, uh, the committee and subcommittee will consider assessments of the Fresh program and feedback on proposals for reform. Uh, the committee and the subcommittee seek to hear testimony uh, from the New York City Economic Development Corp uh, Corporation, the Department of City Planning, fresh incentive recipients uh, and applicants, food justice advocates, and interested members of the public. The FRESH program has two major components to promote the creation and retention of neighborhood grocery stores in underserved communities. Uh, zoning incentives for developers of fresh food stores in certain mixed residential, commercial, and light manufacturing districts throughout northern Manhattan, uh, the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, and Queens, and the financial incentives that were described by Chair Vallone. Uh, the zoning incentives are for new developments, and the financial incentives can be used to create new or preserve existing supermarkets. In order to receive the zoning incentives, the developer must apply for certification as a fresh food store to the chairperson of the City Planning Commission. Uh, this requires the submission of site plans and a lease or commitment by, the, by a participating grocer before the additional floor area is approved. Financial incentives come in the form of real estate tax reductions, sale tax exemptions, and mortgage recording tax deferrals, and an approval by um, NYCIDA on a discretionary basis. The FRESH program offers several possible zoning incentives. Uh, one, additional floor area, uh, additional square 
foot or floor area in a mixed-use building for every square foot provided for a fresh food store, up to the maximum bonus of 20,000 square feet. Two, a uh, is reduction in required parking, depending on the location and the size of the grocery store. Waivers for parking allow for smaller development sites to accommodate a supermarket. Uh, three, a fresh store in M1 zones. M1 zones have a size reduction on supermarkets, but fresh supermarkets are allowed to occupy a larger area up to 30,000 square feet. Prior to the creation of the fresh food zoning text, the DCP created a supermarket needs index using geopartial analysis in order to determine which areas the zoning bonus would be mapped. The SNI is comprised of criteria selected to reflect both the health status of local populations and the economic and geographic barriers they face in acquiring fresh food. When created in 2008, the SNI found that three million New Yorkers were living in areas that, ident that were identified as high need. Since the FRESH program was created in 2009, 32 grocery stores have taken advantage of one or both incentives. 15 of the projects are complete with open stores, while 17 are still in progress. Additionally, two stores received the zoning bonus, but could not secure a grocer, uh, a grocer upon opening. The following are preliminary proposals the Council is seeking feedback on to reform the FRESH program. Expand the list of neighborhoods that are available to receive the FRESH zoning bonus to more closely align with the areas of highest need where the financial incentive is mapped. Potential areas for expansion include parts or all of the following neighborhood districts, Manhattan, portions of CD3, Councilwoman Rivera and Chin, CD7, Levine and Rosenthal, Bronx, CD9, uh, Council Members Salamanca, Jonai, uh, Diaz Sr., uh, CD12, uh, Council Members Cohen, King, Torres, CD10, King and Jonai in Brooklyn, CD7, uh, Menchaca, uh, Lander, uh, CD13, we have Traeger and, and Deutsch, CD12, uh, Jaeger, Lander, Menchaca, Queen, CD1, uh, Constantinides, Van Bramer, CD4, Moya, Ku, Lansman, CD14, Richards, uh, Staten Island, CD1, uh, Rose, uh, Matteo, and two, to identify opportunities for supermarkets on NYCHA-owned land where there is a scarcity of grocery stores. Currently, many campuses are zoned strictly for residential use, which are districts that prohibit grocery stores in order to allow the construction of fresh supermarkets on NYCHA property. An, ex an exemption to the residential zoning district rules on land controlled by NYCHA could be created exclusively for fresh grocery stores. And three, to expand, uh, explore reductions in parking that would encourage additional fresh zoning benefits, ease, uh, ease uh, glazing requirements to work better with recent changes to the building code concerning energy efficiency, consider a large zoning bonus for projects that include a fresh supermarket and are 100% affordable housing, potential deepening the financial incentives in higher need neighborhoods where the existing benefits have not worked to deliver, to deliver grocery stores. Simplify the application process for both financial and zoning incentives to make it less cumbersome for developers who would like to use the program and provide a fresh grocery store increase the visibility of fresh incentives by including the program on HBD term sheets as a potential benefit. Also to improve the oversight and transparency so the public can benefit from the understanding the uh, efficacies of uh, the FRESH program. At this hearing, the Council is evaluating the areas that could benefit most from the expansion of the FRESH zoning incentives. Additionally, the Council is eager to learn more of the experiences of developers and supermarket operators about the ways to improve the application process for the zoning and financial incentives. Finally, the Council is interested in hearing feedback from the administration, related industries, food justice advocates on the draft proposals included in this report to identify approaches to updating and strengthening the program. Uh, I now uh, turn this over to my colleague, uh, Oh, that was already taken care of. I want to thank everyone uh, for the opportunity to read my testimony, and now we can uh, move to questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, well, today's, for those who are joining us, a little bit different than your 
regular council hearing because we're really discussing ideas. There isn't anything on the table as to legislation, but looking at a program that's been around for over 10 years, it hasn't been looked at. So what we want to do as a council, and that's our role here, and joined with different groups, is to, is to look at a program that everyone is eager to kind of give a jump start and, and grow, because the overwhelming need in this city is for supermarkets and for fresh food. Um, and I think from the original onslaught of, of, or the creation, it goes beyond just any particular neighborhood. I think there's every, there isn't a neighborhood in this city that wouldn't like to see the local supermarket survive and the expansion of more fresh food ideas. So what you're, what you're hearing from the council members are ideas. And I, I think both Chair Richards and Moyer presented a few, so I want to give you an opportunity to turn back both to EDC as to some of your thoughts on the expansion of the program and where you think we should take it from here. Sure. Um, um, we, sh we share your interest in evaluating the success of the program um, and believe this is a good time to sort of, it's been almost 10 years, it's time to take a look back and see what's happened. Um, we would support ex expansion of the program in additional areas where a need exists and there's local support. So we're happy to continue to work with the council to try and identify those places. So the identification process. So how, how, what would be the next step in expanding the council? We, uh, council member Moya listed, we have CD3, community uh, districts, th three, seven, nine, 12. Uh, the Bronx is nine and 12. In Brooklyn is CD7, seven, seven and 13 and 12. That was in Brooklyn and Queens. We have Council District 1, Council District 4, and 14, and in Staten Island, uh, Council District 1. Those are some of the original or ones that we can expand to the neighborhoods. So we can expand the eligibility for fresh zoning bonus and to look at the areas of highest need. Um, that process, would we be open to looking at those council districts? Sure, yeah, I think we, we would take those districts and, and any others that get proposed and see how they, we would want to update the supermarket needs index, which was done to, to identify those areas where there's a, both a shortage of supermarkets and a high incidence of uh, health-related, uh, diet-related disease. Um, so we would want to see whether, whether the need exists. Um, and it's also a conversation with local communities because there's the additional bulk and the additional height which can, and the reduction in parking which does have an effect on local neighborhoods. So we'd want to know not only is there need, but is there support in these neighborhoods? And we're happy to continue this dialogue to, to try and figure out where it makes the most sense. Well, I mean, we don't have a lot of success stories here, and I, I see there's 22 stories, and I know Councilmember Richards was just last year really trying to expand, and I know last year you, you did some expansion and you had five new projects, which was a great start. Um, but 22 is not enough in a city of 8.5 million people that everyone's asking for this program to, to really take hold. What are some of the things that you can present today that would streamline the application process and make this more user friendly? Because what we're hearing on all sides, whether you're someone who wants to be the person who's the developer or the purchaser, or someone who wants to be the operator tenant, or someone who lives in the neighborhood, the, the, the timelines, the barriers, the fees involved are, are prohibitive sure. to the process. So we have to take a look at the process. Maybe you want to take us through, if, if, if the three of us wanted to purchase this building and, and it was an existing supermarket on, on, in the building, what would be some of the first steps that we have to go through and which agencies we'd have to deal with? Um, I can speak more to, to a new development. I, I think uh, Krishna can speak to more of the existing. But we're also trying to preserve system. our existing supermarkets, yeah. too. So, so I think we have two, yeah. two challenges. So one is right, not exactly. to lose any yeah. of the ones we have and one to create new ones in areas that are in need and probably any area at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I'll, I can speak to the, the zoning incentives. Um, I guess looking back, when we, we created the program in 2009, it, it was an experiment. Have to say, and I, I think it's one that we were, were we were excited about. We were wondering if this would work. So our, our projections were modest. We we projected 15 stores in 10 years, and we have actually met those expectations. Uh, we have 15 approved stores. We're coming on 10 years, um, so that that's great. I, but I think it's an indication that that this is a program that can work, and we need to think about ways to to make it work better. And I think we're interested in talking about what those opportunities are. In terms of the process, um, the process is one that, that we, we understand is it's always a difficult to come through the land use process. We do believe that it's, it's necessary to ensure that, that these 
properties are delivering what is expected and that these stores remain fresh food stores in the long term and that these are viable projects. And this is not a backdoor to get a, getting around the zoning limitations on what is the appropriate height and density and parking in a neighborhood. The process that does exist is, is one of the sort of uh, less onerous process, which is a certification process. It's ministerial. There, if, if all of the requirements are met, then the, store, then the project needs to be approved. Uh, we do have our, our borough office staff work very closely with applicants to help them navigate this process. And if you were to, if you were a developer and you. So how many total applicants have you received over the 10 years? So how many applications to apply for the fresh process have you received? Not how many have actually been successful and launched, but how many applications actually came your way? There are 15 that have been approved, and I believe another six or seven that are currently at city planning. I can confirm the, those numbers for you. And sometimes we have inquiries that come in, and then for whatever reason, they, well, they that, decide not to pursue For whatever it. reason is what we're curious about. Yeah. Do we, so do we know how yeah. many have started the process and weren't successful and either pulled the application yeah. or gave you reasons as to why they couldn't go forward? I, I'm not sure we can look into that and, and try to understand those questions, I mean, I'm sure the reasons are many, but we could we could certainly try and try and figure that out. I think that a big part of yeah. understanding is how many applicants have, have, have started the process and yeah. have failed or withdrawn their application for whatever reason. I think we need to know of the 22 success stories, how many was it 25 out of 28, 200, 2,000? How many other applicants I, have I'm, you received? Yeah, I'm unaware of anyone that's actually withdrawn an application that's filed. We we get inquiries and have informational meetings, um, but I, I can, I will try to figure that out for sure. With the initial application process, the, the operator tenant must be identified at the beginning? Yes. Has there been any discussion of providing additional time to bring in an operator tenant during the process or extending the time to finding the proper person who can run the fresh supermarket? After the approval, or you mean to, to find the tenant after the approval? Correct. Um, it, it's certainly something we, we could look at. I mean, we're open to ideas to make this, this process easier. I think we would want to ensure that, that before they can build the building that, that there is a, a, a tenant in place. Because what we don't want to happen is them to, to build the building speculating they're going to find a tenant and then find out that, that they, they can't or to claim that they can't. Um, because well, what once if, the building what if is the flip built, side, what if there. the tenant is not able to fulfill their obligations and has removes sure. themselves? So there at this time, my understanding, there isn't any additional time allocated in the application process. So if you lose your, mm -hmm. your operator tenant, you're kind of dead in the water. Yeah, so I mean, that's certainly an idea. We can go back and discuss with our land use review staff and see what the implications of that would be. And I think you started to discuss some additional maybe financial incentives is there something you wanted to bring to the table today? Sure. So, yeah, as I mentioned uh, last year, we uh, changed some of our policies when it comes to fresh um, with the idea of, you know, achieving the goals that you mentioned of expanding the number of supermarkets that uh, that successfully go through the program. Um, one of them um, that you alluded to is increasing the land tax abatement. So previously, uh, there was a land tax abatement that was uh, that depend that vary depending on the number of employees and where the project was located. Um, now in order to expand the program, we've provided a full land tax abatement throughout, um, throughout the city for any project that's eligible for FRESH. Um, and it's you know, relatively recent. We only made the changes the last in a few months ago. But so far, that has uh, resulted in an uptick in the number of projects that have both uh, successfully reached agreements with the IDA as well as pro projects that have express interest and submitted applications. And we hope that um, that change, in addition to uh, reducing the minimum square footage um, that's required, uh, will continue to result in an increase in projects that go through the program. Have you found that those were the two, two reasons that were additional successful, the five new bids that you got this year? Um, that one, and, and the other reason was also a change in making it easier for developers to apply through the program. So previously, uh, the program was designed specifically for owner operators to apply and receive benefits, um, but we've seen an increase in the number of mixed use projects where there's a residential portion as well as a supermarket on the ground floor. And we made a change to make it easier for those projects to come through 
our process, and we have seen that, in addition to the other changes, has resulted in, in an increase in uh, projects. So have, have the projects that come forward, are they utilizing both benefits for the land use and the financial, or are there certain projects that are just using one and not the other? Um, so it's a mix. So there are projects that definitely take advantage of both benefits, um, but we also see projects that are led by an owner-operator who might um, only take advantage of the financial benefits, but not necessarily um, the zoning benefits. So is there a need then maybe to discuss the, the separation of the process for one and two or to, to increase both? I think we should look at both financial package as well as the zoning limitations and restrictions and, and increasing from not just communities in need, but to, to really all communities, because I think the need for fresh food in the city at this point is, is self-evident. There really isn't a lot of place. One thing we haven't talked about is preservation of existing supermarkets. Is there anything that we can talk about for the future of those supermarkets? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, the the fresh program, the zoning program, is really about in, increasing the number, total number of supermarkets. It wasn't designed as a as to, to to preserve existing supermarkets. You know, that said, to to qualify for the fresh certification, you have to have an agreement with a supermarket operator. To the extent that um, the, the the connections can be made with local supermarkets who are looking for space space that will where there is more certainty or more stability over the long term, these projects do provide real opportunities for those supermarkets and making those connections can be an opportunity for local neighborhoods. I don't think there was a lot there that I could grab on. I was trying to figure out what we could do as to offer as maybe a new program for new for existing uh, operators, and I think that's where the fear in the neighborhood starts. Because we all hear as a council member that there's a, a trust supermarket in trouble. They can't handle the retail market value of their property based on what a developer could possibly get for that. And that starts the process. And then the fear builds in the neighborhood that we're going to lose our local ABC store or whatever it is. And that's something some big box store is going to come in or some development's going to come in. I think we can be proactive in that process and, and realizing the limitations of the, the rental value and trying to preserve with subsidies what an owner operator could get for that property to keep, the, to keep the supermarket, keep the employees that are at that supermarket, which are mostly usually our local uh, family members that are employed there, provide the best possible pay and benefits for those employees. And in this way, it's a, it's a cyclical benefit to everyone that's there. Yeah, and it's, it's also uh, worth pointing out that the, the fresh zoning incentives are, are part of a multi-pronged strategy and the, the, the tax incentives are really probably the sort of more effective tool at, at supporting existing operators of supermarkets. Is there yeah, a and I can, oh, I can speak a little bit Please, in terms of um, you know, uh, the work that we do to preserve um, supermarkets. So uh, for supermarkets that are existing um, and want to pre uh, engage in a project to improve their store either by uh, uh, changing the layout or buying new equipment. Um, we can provide incentives for those types of uh, pro projects, um, basically the same incentives that, um, that we discussed earlier. Um, the challenge is uh, obviously that um, for projects to be eligible for FRESH, they have to be making an investment um, in the property um, in order to, um, to take advantage of those benefits. Um, and we, um, but that being said, we definitely share the same concern about being able to preserve supermarkets, and we believe that b through the incentives, we can help supermarkets to make investments that can make them more viable, to, you know, change with um, the communities that might, um, to, you know, it, for communities that, um, that have been around and have had a, a, you know, have had difficulty accessing fresh produce, we can, help uh, supermarkets to increase their um, produce um, options and their services, and that can you know, potentially make them more financially viable and keep them around going into the future. I missed the beginning portion of that because I just got a text from my son who finished fifth grade with a 99.9% .9 average, which was very happy for him. So daddy's very happy. Good job, Charlie. Uh, who's also a diehard Argentina fan, and so we share that, and he's already <laughs> saying, Dad, it's almost 2 o'clock, so we're going to wrap it. So with that, I'd like to chair it back over first to Chair Moyer and then Chair Richards for their questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. Um, so we, we've identified opportunities for supermarkets on uh, NYCHA-owned land um, where there is 
the scarcity of grocery stores. Um, currently, many of the campuses are, are zoned strictly for residential use, which are districts that prohibit grocery stores. In order to allow the construction of uh, fresh supermarkets on NYCHA property, an exemption of residential zoning district rules on land controlled by NYCHA could be created exclusively for fresh grocery stores. Is this a reasonable change that we can make to the policies? Uh, yeah, yes, I would say um, they, there was a real opportunity here. And then we have actually done this before as part of some as part of a neighborhood study typically because you would as as, as you as you mentioned it, many of the NYCHA campuses don't actually have zoning to permit a supermarket so the in addition to the process to certify the store you'd have to have the zoning just to allow the use uh, I mean if there's support for these kinds of changes if it's appropriate if there's a need city planning is certainly willing to work with NYCHA and the council on, on identifying places where this makes sense Alternatively, and we have, have done this before near Astoria houses, is that the, the program could also be expanded to those areas that already have the zoning that are located near NYCHA campuses, which is, is, is another process that, that where it may be less for us disruptive in, in, in having this, the construction on the campus itself, but that's, these are both options that we could consider. Okay, because obviously, as you know, these are the areas that are most affected by the lack of, of access to uh, quality and fresh mm -hmm. produce. Uh, for me, I have the district that has the highest rate of childhood obesity. There's a lack of, mm -hmm. of opportunities um, for fresh produce. Um, so this would be something where we should be definitely looking at um, really doing a reevaluation of how we go about identifying uh, areas where we can bring these programs in. Uh, we can do the zoning changes to make sure that these programs come in and could be uh, beneficial to the community. Um, DCP was conducting a study uh, that included uh, updated mapping of supermarket locations compared to the population density. Uh, can, can you share those findings with us? Sure. Um the, the findings were that what we found is that, that most districts have seen an in increase in supermarket square footage relative to the population. Um, in a few cases, the population growth outpaced the increase in supermarket square footage, and that was true in Bronx uh, Community District 5, Brooklyn Districts 2, 3, 6, 7, 13, and 16, uh, and Manhattan Districts 5, 7, and 10. Uh, in Queens, Districts 1, 2, and 4, and Staten Island, Community District Three. Uh, there were a, there were a handful of districts that had no significant change in population or supermarket square footage. This was Manhattan Community District Twelve, Queens Community District Five and Thirteen, and Brooklyn Eighteen. Uh, the remainder of all the community districts, we actually saw uh, an increase in supermarket square footage to population. So, the market is does appear to be producing more supermarkets in New York City. This is this is good news, and but we're but I think fresh continues to be an important part to, to make sure those supermarkets are also growing in places where there's the greatest need. So how do, you, how do you see that we can improve the oversight and transparency so that the public uh, can benefit from understanding uh, of what this program uh, actually does and how it benefits the community? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we currently, we currently, the information that we do, do prepare is consolidated and is on EDC's website, um, just because I think it's, it's easier to make sure that accurate information is kept in one place. But we can certainly make that easier to get to from our website. Um, right now, the, the program, you know, the part of the, the, the process, which we, we understand is can be can be time consuming, uh, is necessary for part of for notification and, and oversight. So there's this trade-off between sort of the ease of use of the program and, and uh, the assurance of the, the effectiveness and the oversight of the program. So this is uh, the, currently the applications for certifications must get referred to community boards. Um, and there is a reporting process where uh, uh, owners of, of properties with fresh supermarkets have to, to, to send a letter reporting exactly that, that, that they're in compliance with the program and have to take pictures of the space to show that they're in compliance. We are, that's required about, uh, the zoning text requires this after three, three years after the approval. We're now at the point where some of these stores have reached that point, so we're 
beginning discussions internally on the protocol to ensure that that, that happens. Okay. Um, and also, so what, I, and I might have missed this, but I'm sorry if, if I'm being repetitive, but what are the latest numbers of the participants in the, in the FRESH program? Sure. Um, for the, the zoning incentive, the, the zoning incentive and the, the IDA incentive are um, not mutually exclusive, but you, they, they are separate programs. For the, for the zoning program, we've had uh, 15 projects have been approved. Um, one is, one is uh, in the public review process currently. We have several additional applications um, that are in, in the pre-application phase. I don't have the exact number, but I can get back to you with that. Um, of these 15 certified stores that have been approved, five of those came in for the authorization for additional height. So they were located in districts where there are height limits. Um, the remainder stores were, were taking advantage of the, the parking and the floor area exemption. Um, three fresh food stores took advantage of the uh, additional allowance for a larger store in a light manufacturing district. So currently in our light manufacturing districts, supermarkets are limited in size to 10,000 square feet. Stores that qualify as a fresh food store can build up to 30,000 square feet without going through the City Planning Commission's special permit approval process, which is a more onerous process than the fresh, fresh food certification process. Um, those stores are, they're, of the stores that are open, nine are in central Brooklyn. Um, I'm sorry, of the stores that have been approved, nine are in central Brooklyn. One, is, one of those is open and five are under construction. Uh, there's one in the South Bronx, which is, is open and operating. There's uh, three in Manhattan. Uh, one of those stores is open, two are under construction. And, and there's one store in Western Queens that we, I understand is under construction. And it appears that the, the, the data set is incomplete on the EDC website. It, is there a reason why the, the data set is still incomplete? Uh, uh, we are um, actively working to make sure that the EDC website is as up to date as possible. Um, and, and we have noticed that um, there are some discrepancies in terms of um, projects that are complete that are not uh, described as being complete on our website, and we're actively uh, working to change so, that. So, how frequently do you update? So we update it. Um, so we update it whenever a project uh, is um, approved, and whenever it. Um, has a final agreement that's achieved um, between um, the IDA and that supermarket. We also have a, a compliance team that regularly uh, checks on supermarkets to make sure that they are open. And whenever we get um, word from them, we update the, uh, the website um, to reflect so that. So what's that, when you say regularly, what is that? Um, every they, week, every um, month? Every, uh, every year, they, so throughout the portfolio, they go through about a quarter of the projects every year um, to uh, have an, a physical visit and but they also are regularly by regularly meaning every year um, getting certifications from the supermarket operator to confirm that they're on schedule with their project and who maintains the list of participating projects uh, so it's uh, both of our departments so um, idea as well as uh, Department of City Planning so IDA is in charge? City planning provides City planning. the data okay. to, as, as requested on the, on the zoning program to, to the IDA. Um, I should say there's been a lot of activity in the program. When the program came out was just after the recession. So there was actually slow uptake in the first few years. We've seen sort of a, a sort of it, the participation in the program as the zoning incentives increase much more in the last few years as, as we've seen that because it sort of ebbs and flows along with the development market cycles. Um, so we, we are needing, we did more recently need to update this and we wanted to make sure we had the most updated information for the hearing today. And we will share this information with um, EDC and the IDA after this hearing to make sure that the information on the website is current. So that leads to my next question is, how do you all coordinate this information gathering? We, we're in regular communication between our two agencies and, and also with the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. Um, whenever there's a request for it, we provide it. Uh, when, when we're aware of applications that are coming through the process, we notify. How many, how many applications so far this year? Applications? Yeah. I'm not, I have to, that have been, 
uh, that have been that into the process? Yes. We, I'm not sure. I can confirm, but we can find out how many applicants. Thank you. Exist, yeah. um, and then just one more question, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um, but can we just go back to the cost of the current uh, land tax abatement uh, commitment for the, the projects that are receiving financial incentives? If you can just go over that. Uh, do you mean? Uh, What's the cost? So the total cost as we um, measure it, um, so I'll, I can give you the costs in terms of all of the incentives, which includes land tax plus uh, property tax, yep. um, as well as um, the sales tax and mortgage reported tax benefits. It's about uh, $63 million, and we measure that over the 25-year period that um, these projects have a, uh, a term with the IDA. So um, over that 25-year period, um, each project um, can be getting a range of benefits um, that might uh, be as little as 500000 um, if it's a project that is just taking advantage of the sales tax exemption um, to several million dollars for projects that are getting a property tax abatement as well as sales tax and mortgage recording tax benefits. Okay, thank you. We've been joined by Council Members Rosenthal, Reynoso, Levin, Powers, and Lander. And then I'd like to turn to Council Member Richards and then Ku. Uh, and since we have quite a few panels and quite a few Council Members, I think three minutes were for Council Members, we can always stretch. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, so can we go through, so obviously we had this task force last year and um, we, the Council came up with a, a set of recommendations we thought would be useful in moving um, this program forward. So uh, what I'm interested in hearing is a little bit more on why we're not further along and really thinking about districts that this program should be expanded in. So can you speak to why it's taken so long for us to actually move this program forward with the recommendations given to you? I mean, we're, we're, we have been and continue to have conversations with the council on, on where it's appropriate and also need some assurances that, that these are districts where there's local support for it. Um, I think that the additional bulk and, and height is our, our, our can have impacts on communities and uh, we don't, although there are needs, there's also, there also needs to be sort of acceptance of the program, um, so that's I definitely get that, but there are certainly rezonings uh -huh. that have mm -hmm. taken a foot. Yeah. Um, we also passed EQA, mm -hmm. uh, MIH. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the coordination between DCP, EDC, mm -hmm. uh, DOH on FRESH, because it seems to me like there's not a real concerted effort to really get the program expanded to the degree we need it uh, in the city. So for instance, I mean, a perfect opportunity, and I think an opportunity lost, but still an opportunity, um, was, you know, obviously we went through a rezoning in downtown Far Rockaway. So, um, and we, and obviously there was support for it, we passed it here. Can you speak to the coordination between the agencies and having conversations in, for underserved communities? Because that, this community would certainly serve as a model as an underserved community. Whenever we do land use actions, typically for the land use action, city planning is the lead, and in some instances, EDC is, is managing the project, is the applicant on the project. Uh, we work very closely with EDC on those projects, and with HBD is coming through as well. Um, we would coordinate with them, and if there are, if there's interest from the local council member, local community in expanding fresh, we are always open to, to working with them to see if that's appropriate and makes sense and do what we need to do to make that happen. So I hear you on that, but how would a community know what the fresh program is? And how would local council members know? I mean, I knew because I chaired the zoning committee, mm -hmm. but how I'm interested in knowing how do you market, how do you promote uh, this program? It and will, also, yeah. you know, DOH obviously comes out with their community district needs every year. Yeah. How does DOH, DOH yeah. so, utilize see, that information that they receive to, I'll ask the chairs to indulge with me a few more minutes, but how does, I'm just interested in hearing what the coordination looks like. Sure. Um, the, the marketing of the program doesn't happen out of the Department of City 
planning. There are other agencies that are involved, such as the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, and I believe the EDC also does okay, some Okay, I'm looking for so. steps, so I hear that, but uh -huh. how, what does that look like? What does marketing and getting information out to the public look like? Do they do mailers? Do they, are there posters put up in places? Yeah, I can a speak in terms of, right, in terms of the marketing, me. we, uh, we go to events. Um, we have regular meetings both with supermarket uh, operators and associations as well as real estate developers, real estate brokers um, to make them and, you know, larger um, members, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations um, to make them aware of the program. Um, that being said, we definitely um, can do more and we would um, welcome the opportunity to work with your um, with your group and, um, and with um, all the council members to think of a strategy for increasing outreach. If there are any projects in your district that you're aware of or supermarkets that might be interested in the program, um, we definitely would love to talk to them and have meetings with them. We have those meetings you know, on an ongoing basis, but we um, definitely would love to work with you guys in terms of, uh, of you know, increasing the outreach of, of the program. So if we were, just to be purely honest, we're not doing the job we should do. So I'm just hoping that moving forward after this hearing, there will be definitely a little bit more outreach and coordination um, around this. Because I, I'm sure if I went and spoke to my super, I, because I'm aware of the program, I could bring it up mm -hmm. to supermarket owners in my district. But I'm pretty sure if, you, if we poll majority of the council or polled majority of supermarket owners out there, they would know nothing of the program. Um, can you speak to it? I know we were, you, you spoke of, you know, obviously there being um, uh, you're supportive of the possibility of NYCHA housing, certainly having this program. Can you speak to how we could move forward to ensure that there, there is an opportunity for more commercial overlay thoughts when it comes to NYCHA? So there's, um, we have already scheduled a follow up with the council on on how on moving ahead with these conversations and I, I that should be part of it i mean just as we would expand it to other areas nycha should be part of that conversation so i, I think certainly this is something we, we should look into there's a real i think a real opportunity here and also certainly a need so i'm not going to take much more time up yeah, for, question for questions question. but the point i want to make is that i i just feel like you know we've I mean, some of these recommendations, the council did a retail diversity study. We now are going into 2018. The program has not expanded. Um, I, I'm just hoping that post this hearing, we're going to really take this issue seriously. Um, you know, there are communities out there that have access, very little food access, and these are the common communities where that the largest health disparities exist, right? Poor transportation, obesity, diabetes too. So, you know, as we talk about making the city a fairer city, you know, one way to do that is to ensure that there's real coordination happening in the area of food access, because that's what, the lack of food access is what leads people to hospitals, right? And, and, and cause a lot of underlying issues uh, for our community. So since I don't have, another minute to speak. I'm just hoping that over the course of the next few months, hopefully a month, we'll really see some real movement on this. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. And the following council members, just so you know where it's gonna be Ku, Torres, Williams, Rivera, Adams, Menchaca, Reynoso, and Powers. So we start with Councilmember Ku for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair Moyer and Chair Wallon, and thank you for coming to testify. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, here in, uh, in Queens, CD4, uh, which is part of my district, uh, that we need uh, uh, more supermarkets. But according to my research, uh, in my area, we have like 18 supermarkets already, so we don't need any uh, more supermarkets. You know, that's the point I want to make, because uh, because we are in a transit hub, uh, it's convenient. Uh, and in, uh, we are already too congested. We are like more than enough supermarkets already. So my point is that supermarket is a 
So very tough business. It's very in the high volume, uh, a lot of manpower, and the inventory is per perishable. So you can only keep it for a few days. The like bananas, apples, they get spoiled very fast. So you need, you need a large, large population to support the supermarket. You, you cannot just say, hey, we give you in incentive. Open one here, open one there. If there's not enough population in certain areas, uh, they won't survive. That's why like for 10 years, this program, right, you, you, you only attracted how many? 15 open already. Uh, 15 approved. They're already open, right? So uh, every year, you only have one or, st one or two stores open. But so far, four. How many, uh, sorry, I understand the question. Yeah, Talk for 10 you. years. This program has been in operation for 10 years. Uh -huh. But you only have like 15 or 16 uh, supermarkets already in operation. So there are th three in operation, 15 that have been approved. Um, only three in operation? In operation, another eight under construction. This is pretty consistent with, as, as I sort of said earlier, that pretty consistent yeah. with the projections. We projected 15. It's a mo it was a modest program, like I said, an experiment. And uh, we were projected 15 stores in 10 years and we seem to be on track for close to 10 years. We'll be on track to get there. Uh, I think the there are questions of whether we could expand it more. Then there's also the incentive program, which has, which, which is, it brings in quite a few additional stores as well. Right. Oh, so yeah, right. And it, oh, I'm sorry. In addition to the, uh, the three that have opened, um, that are receiving zoning benefits, there's also 15 um, that are open that have received tax incentives. Um, one of the, you know, challenges in terms of um, why there aren't more openings is that these are, uh, a lot of them are new construction projects, which take a long time to actually um, come online, um, usually two to three years at least. Um, so that's part of the delay, and we expect that in the next few years, a lot of the projects that have been approved that are under construction now will be um, complete and ready to go. And another point I want to make is that has the city does uh, uh, do anything in education. You no, know, we had to tell the people, you no, know, eating fresh food is good for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, we had to start that when they're young, in, in kindergarten. You no, know, eat banana, apple is good for you. Don't eat potato chips, don't drink soda, those things, you know. We st start young, otherwise we just, you know, once they get the habit on, it's very hard to change their habit when, when they like sugar stuff. You no, know, those, I mean, that approach is more important in, in terms of like cutting down on obesity, you know, diabetes, all this other stuff. No, educate the young while they're in kindergarten. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ku. I now want to, one, before we turn it over to Council Member Torres, want to recognize uh, Council Member Cornegy, who has joined us today. Thank you and welcome, uh, Council Member Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to share an experience in my own district. I represent Fordham Road, which is the largest commercial district in the Bronx, one of the largest in the city. And under the FRESH program, EDC made a decision to grant subsidies to Western Beef to locate itself in Fordham Road. And, and it seems to me a business like Western Beef could operate successfully in a heavily trafficked commercial district like Fordham Road. So do, do you do you know for sure that you're subsidizing businesses that could not succeed in the absence of the subsidy, especially in a heavily trafficked commercial district like Fordham Road? Uh, yes, we're um, confident that, um, that our incentives are necessary for these uh, projects to take place. Um, as part of our due diligence for any project, we look at uh, their financials. Um, we look at their projected financials and basically look at how viable the project would be both with and without incentives. And for all of our projects, including that one, the determination was made that, it, um, that incentives were necessary to make sure that the supermarket was viable. Um, in addition, by viable, um, the goal is to make sure that supermarkets are able to succeed by being affordable and without necessarily needing to increase prices. So I think that that's another thing that we look at um, is making sure that supermarkets, based on their existing model and being able to serve the residents of that area, that they're able to be successful um, through our incentives. So, do, do, do you keep track of whether a, a large supermarket like Western Beef 
has the effect of displacing mom and pop supermarkets in the neighborhood? Is that something that you track? We uh, we have we um, you know keep track of the number of supermarkets that are in a particular area. Um, we can you know. Do you track do displacement specifically? We uh, do not track displacement okay. specifically, and our but that being said, we do uh, have a what we call a sort of a census, a, a, a map that has the number of supermarkets in a particular area. Because if we were subsidizing businesses that were then displacing mom and pop supermarkets that would seem to defeat the purpose of the program. Right, and, but, uh, yeah. So it so seems guess, like, it right. seems worthwhile to track whether we were displacing existing businesses. Now you said there was an increase in the square footage, but does the increase in the square footage necessarily mean that there's a net improvement in access? It could mean that there was a displacement of small businesses in favor of big businesses. Uh, that is uh, not the case. So we, um, we provide incentives for a range of supermarkets, and one of the things that we changed is by reducing the minimum square footage to 5,000 square feet, the goal is to capture a lot of smaller stores um, who, you know, have a huge impact in, um, in increasing food access in areas. Um, but so, yes, the overall goal is to increase square footage, but we do that both through supporting smaller stores as well as larger stores. We don't have a sort of a, a preference in terms of um, the size of the store. And just one quick question. What are, what are the number of supermarkets? Because obviously NYCHA has an info program, a development program. We know that there are, there's an epidemic of food deserts on NYCHA campuses. What are the number of supermarkets that you've cited in, on NYCHA facilities? So at least in the through um, the IDA, um, I'm not aware of any uh, projects that are directly on NYCHA property. There are some projects that are adjacent to uh, NYCHA developments, and we can follow up with. Are there plans to site supermarkets on NYCHA properties? Is there active coordination with H uh, HPD and NYCHA? It's p p one of the recommendations that has come out of the City Council on which we believe is worth evaluating is whether we should be exploring, whether we should be Allow, allow, creating zoning to allow for supermarkets on NYCHA campuses, the challenge now is that... Uh, with respect, I mean, my, much as I love the City Council, yeah. uh, we knew that there were food deserts in NYCHA before the recommendations of the City Council. We're in year five of the info program. It seems like there's no active coordination between EDC and NYCHA on how to bring supermarkets to NYCHA. So if there's interest and support in, in advancing the, the additional actions that would be necessary to encourage more supermarkets on NYCHA campuses. We you know, have to look into that. We think it, there's a real opportunity there. We want to work with NYCHA and local communities to make sure it makes sense. We have seen one project that in Queens near Astoria houses that, that did take advantage of the zoning incentives and is under construction right now. Um, we, that, was, uh, at the, that area was added as part of a rezoning for the, specifically for that purpose. So we will also continue to see if there are other opportunities where we can increase access to fresh food for these populations. I'm over my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I now turn it over to Council Member Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to try to get through this uh, quickly, and I apologize. I'm sure you may have said some of this in your testimony. But uh, what's the rationale again for different um, having three different zones, why can't some places have, why does everybody just have the zoning and, and the money? What, what's the, the rationale for the two different ones? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The rationale for having, so I have a map that breaks up my district, I guess, in uh, zoning only, um, incentives, zoning and taxes, and money only. Um, why, why is the rationale for those? So the, the current program was adopted in 2009. It was uh, based on an index, a supermarket needs index, that identified those locations where there was both a shortage of supermarkets and a high incidence of, of diet-related uh, diet disease. Um, so it's, it was a combination of, you know, whether these are geographies that had, where there was a need, but also whether these were communities that were supportive of the additional zoning changes, that whether they were, whether communities say they were willing to make the trade off of more density, less parking, and more height in exchange for the, the opportunity to have more fresh food stores. So the zoning incentives are based on what the zoning currently is? It's, it's based on there are, are maps in the zoning resolution that identifies areas where the which, program... What, which zoning resolution, I'm sorry? This, the New York City zoning resolution. The new one or the one we did before? The existing zoning one. 
So this is looking at the existing zoning of my district. And based on the existing zoning, there are some places that can sustain additional um, extra zoning and some places they can't? There are, are districts, there are locations within your district where their properties are eligible for the zoning incentives to encourage a grocery store? Because of the yeah. zoning that exists? Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Because there's, there's an area that says zoning only that we're actually trying to get a supermarket now, but it, they should have, so, so what about the places that have do have zoning, like this area? Why wouldn't they have the money overlay also? So yeah, I can speak to that. So it basically has to do with the state law that governs the IDA and where the IDA can provide tax incentives. Um, basically, according to that law, the areas have to be meet a definition of being highly distressed, which means that they have a poverty rate above 20% and an unemployment rate that's 25% more what's than an the area? state average. What's, what's the area? What's the it's by census tract. By census tract. Right, yes. Oh, so um, so basically, in order to be eligible for the incentives, has to meet both of those. So because this one is Glenwood Houses, and I would assume that it's only would allow some additional in Glenwood Houses, but it just says money only. So why, why would that not have both overlays? So, so this, the current the current, Nature. where the, the, the zoning is currently, where the incentive is currently applicable, are those locations where the, that were adopted as part of the program in 2009? We, now that we're 10 years in, or close to 10 years in, we are at a point where we want to sort of evaluate whether there are, are areas where it makes sense to expand it. So I think it's a conversation that we are intending to continue with the council. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I would say yes, absolutely. Um, Two things, um, I, I heard you mention the groups that you speak to. I didn't hear community boards, and so I'm not sure if you go to community boards to have these conversations to try to spread this information. And secondly, I was listening to communications um, of agency. It seems to me that just someone can be working with DOB to see what kind of applicants are being, um, uh, what kind of application are being put in, because put in. I'm not sure how the owners I'm working with in certain areas would know that these incentives exist or how supermarkets would know that these incentives exist at this current time. It seems, there seems to be no connective tissue at all. There seems to be a program up in the air. If you happen to know about it, it's great. Um, but so those are just a couple of ideas I, I want to work out because we're actually trying to get supermarkets in a couple of places now. And if I didn't have this information, I wouldn't be able to provide it to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I want to turn it over to uh, Councilwoman Rivera. Thank you, Chair Vallone, Chair Moya, uh, for your leadership on this. Um, I want to ask about, so, and again, thank you for mentioning some of the Manhattan portions that we're hoping to get supermarkets in. Many people think, you know, my district, Lower East Side up to Murray Hill, clearly districts of, of wealth and money, but as we get lower into the Lower East Side and uh, Council Member Chin's district, um, there are pockets of poverty there and tens of thousands of units of public housing. And so one, one supermarket in particular that was there that was, turned, uh, that was torn down was on Pike Slip and Cherry Street, and it was the Pathmark. And when Extel, who we're counting on, and everyone here should know Extel because they're the poor door people, is they are saying they're going to bring in a supermarket back to that space for the community. Our worry is, and what my questions are to you is, how do we ensure that the supermarkets that do come back to the community or are constructed in the community are actually affordable? And in terms of the living wages and the jobs that are provided there, how do we make sure that the people that are working in these supermarkets have a living wage and they're not excluded from these types of standards that are important in specifically these transit and food deserts where there are low-income communities? Uh, regarding the... The intent of the, the of the fresh program is really to in, increase the number of supermarkets in the neighborhood. It it doesn't sort of address the the cost of the the food sold in the neighborhood. But the, the uh, it, by increasing the number of stores, we are increasing the options that are available. Uh, many of the districts in Manhattan are not currently eligible for the program, but I think moving forward and some of the recommendations that we're hearing, um, we can explore whether it makes sense. For instance, to do it on or near NYCHA campuses is something that, that's been proposed, which we think is an opportunity worth looking into. 
um, as well as uh, other districts that, that meet the supermarket needs index and where there's actually a demonstrated need. I, you know, my mother, single mom, raised me and my sister. We were so dependent on that path mark because of the price points. If you went and you had put a Whole Foods there, when my mother's trying to raise two girls in the 90s on a, you know, civil servant salary, it is, it is not sustainable. And so I, I realize that you're looking to place these brick and mortar facilities there, but if we're not looking at how low income these communities are, and, and when you look at 25% unemployment as one of your own criteria, but you're not looking at bringing living wages into the area, I really ask you to reconsider uh, your whole formula and to really revise this plan, of course, in conjunction with the city council. So on the uh, living wage point, and as well as the affordability point, um, so um, in terms of living wage, every project that submits an application has to, uh, has to provide detailed information in terms of what they pay their employees. They also have to provide payroll data that we use to verify that they are paying um, at least $15, or at least um, the minimum wage, which will um, end up being $15 an hour, um, which is above living wage. So basically, as part of our vetting process, we can, we, you know, place a great d uh, amount of importance on making sure that, um, that supermarkets are paying their employees um, what they're supposed to be paying them. And we also ask for information about benefits that they are providing to employees, you know, such as health care and um, contributions to retirement plan. So um, although it's primi primarily a food access program, we place a lot of importance on the employment part of it that you um, have mentioned, that that is something that we take very seriously. Thank you. Um, I now want to turn it over to Chair Adams. Thank you very much, Chair Moya. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, I represent uh, portions of Southeast Queens and uh, unfortunately, uh, in April, there was an article that came out uh, in our local publications authored by Public Health Solutions, and it labeled parts of Queens, um, uh, Jackson Heights, Corona, and Jamaica as food swamps. I keep hearing the expression food deserts, but food swamps, and as, as you well know, those are areas where fast food chains uh, pretty much dominate the area and saturate low-income areas. So my concern, like uh, the concern of so many of my colleagues, um, particularly uh, council members uh, Williams and uh, Richards, uh, who mentioned marketing and marketing strategy, uh, it, it, and, and council member Richards mentioned your, your outreach to uh, entities like the community board. I'm a chair of, a former chair of community board 12 in Queens, and regularly community boards welcome um, you. And, uh, and, and everybody like you to bring in things that are so, so, so very, very desperately needed uh, in communities of need, uh, where we have asked time after time for fresh food to be brought into our communities, and yet we get labeled in our communities derogatory terms like food swamps, and we all know who lives in swamps, but I won't go there today. Um, my, my, my question is, uh, in your testimony you referenced um, applicable shopping districts, districts, and you reference, you did reference uh, portions of my community board, or one of them, Community District 12. Do you actually have partners within uh, the district, uh, downtown Jamaica, and specific plans with specific entities and a specific location uh, for any projects in Queens, in downtown Jamaica at this point? Um, in terms of uh, EDs, um, the pr uh, incentives provided, um, the financial incentives, we don't necessarily have any projects um, in the pipeline that are in um, Jamaica. That being said, we uh, welcome the opportunity to talk to the community board, to talk to any developers and um, any organizations in your district um, to increase awareness um, about the FRESH program. Okay, so that, that brings me to a little bit of confusion. When you have located areas, what is your outreach? What, what, are, what do you do proactively to make this happen, to make portions of this testimony a reality when you know that there are applicable spaces available in selected neighborhoods? What do you do proactively to make your vision a reality? So the, the zoning program is, is, is only is one tool in a broader strategy to address food-related 
concerns and to improve access to food in neighborhoods, in communities in the city. We work closely. There are other partners in the city, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy and the Department of Health that have a number of strategies to go out to communities and inform them of of programs that are available to address these concerns. The, the zoning program, I think, gets a lot of attention and it's, 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 it's a popular one, but it's a modest one. It's really part of a broader strategy. And we, we were certainly happy to, to work closely with, with communities as they can bring, as they are aware of, of projects that can come through and we're hoping to work with the council to think of ideas to, to publicize the program that does seem to, to be successful um, and, and we're hoping could be more broadly used. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I just have to echo uh, sentiments again of my colleagues. Um, this seems like a program that has so, so much potential that's just l really just dangling in limbo for a lot of us and a lot of our communities that have been disenfranchised for so long. And I really hope that there is something that we can do collectively with you as partners to actually make a lot of this uh, become such a much needed reality for the city of New York. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Adams. I want to turn it over to Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, welcome and thank you for your testimony and thank you for this hearing. Um, the FRESH program. So, Council Member Adams uh, just talked about how unfortunate um, it is that in her community um, we don't have more of the FRESH uh, opportunities, I guess. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the application process itself. And I, wanna, I want you to go through with me what I'm, I'm hearing is a cumbersome application process. In some cases, supermarkets that are familiar with these poor communities um, that are smaller, not chain owned, for example, uh, have a hard time having to fill out this application or need resources related to accountants at times, lawyers at times. Why would we make a program that, want, that promotes fresh food and it's called fresh, uh, why make it so difficult? Why not figure out a way to make this process as easy as possible for supermarkets to take advantage of instead of making it uh, onerous um, uh, and, and dis disincentivize them from actually wanting to join? Yeah. So th thank you for the question. It, there's a balance between making the program easy to use and, and to have it be broadly applicable and ensuring that the program actually delivers what it's intended to deliver. As I can speak to the zoning incentives, which communities, this provides pretty generous zoning benefits in terms of more floor area, taller buildings, less parking. Um, and if we don't have some sort of approvals in place and some assurance that the, 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 the projects that get developed are actually gonna provide a supermarket and a supermarket that can be viable in the long term, that, that we're really doing a disservice and we're providing a back tour to really get around the zoning resolution. The process that we have, unfortunately, once you come to city planning, there is a sort of a, a cost of entry, but the process that we do have is, is, um, is among our more simple processes. If, if a project meets the requirements, the, the, we ha it has to be approved. But we so, understand um, that this, yeah. is, this is challenging for, for, can be a challenge and we're, would we'll, love to work with you to figure out ways to make this yeah, easier. Yeah, just make the application yeah. simpler. I'll tell you that, very st straightforward. Make it simpler for supermarkets so they can be incentivized to take advantage of it and provide fresh food to food deserts in our city. Very simple. And it seems like when I talk to you about supermarkets, you talk to me about developers. Um, I have a, a strange feeling uh, that could possibly be true that maybe the developers are the ones getting all the benefits from what's happening here um, or from you know taxes, uh, related to taxes and related to FAR, uh, and maybe those uh, benefits are not translating to the supermarket owners. Um, can you tell me the difference between the benefits that a developer gets versus the developer that a supermarket gets? Mm -hmm. and, and also, a second part to that, because I'm running out of time, is if a supermarket can no longer be in that space uh, because the rent is too high, for example, uh, do we reinstate parking requirements? Do we take away the FAR? Do we take away their taxes? Because um, you say you don't want them to go through a backdoor channel, but what protections are there for the supermarkets? What resources are there for the supermarkets? What taxes um, uh, are you giving? Like, I want to know what the resources that the supermarket gets so it could stay there. Um, because in a lot of our communities, they're being priced out. Um, and it seems like you guys are taking care of the developers and are leaving the supermarkets to dry. So the, the, the program is two-pronged. So the, the zoning incentives are 
really about redevelopment. So it's when sites get redevelopment, how do we encourage that project to have a grocery store in there and how to keep it a, a grocery store over the long term? So it, it is sort of by definition a program that is tied to development. Um, the incentive program, which I can allow Christian to speak to, is, is not and intended to, they're intended to be complementary programs so that, that we don't have, it's not only about new development. Um, but to your question about how do we, how do you make sure that that supermarket can stay there in the long term, um, once the, the space is built, it can only be rented to a qualifying supermarket. So it has to have, they have to provide a line of food products, of fresh food products that, that to serve as a resource for the community. Or they lose their, they lose their tax break? So, will, so you can speak mm -hmm. to the tax break. For the but. tax breaks, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so if a supermarket um, is no longer operational, they would be, we would A, terminate the tax <coughs> benefits, and they would also potentially be subject to recapture to basically repay the benefits that they received. So the benefits have to, and also um, to your earlier point, the tax incentives directly go to supermarkets. Um, so if the supermarket is no longer there, we you know just end or uh, end the um, benefit period and or as I said, um, recapture benefits. We we gotta we gotta go. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Very, I'm very Norman. concerned about this program, Chair. Thank you. Uh, now we move it over to Council Member Powers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a follow-up question to the council member. They would still keep their density though, right? They'd still keep their height density even if they ended the, ended the, got rid of the supermarket? Yeah, I mean, this is why we are, why we have the process that we have because once the building is built, it's, it's hard to Unbuild it. Yeah. undo it. I mean, and you, it, you, it's impractical in most cases to add the parking. If, if, but it does happen that sometimes over the long term a store might not be viable there may not be a market for the store in the neighborhood to rent that there is a process to come back to the department of city planning to say that you've made a good faith effort to market that space to a qualifying supermarket and you just can't find a tenant it's a relief valve but we take it very seriously you can't just lease that space without first coming back to the department of city planning gotcha and the um the, so, I, you know, I, I look at that process and some, at some point maybe talk to you guys about it just to ensure that we're not adding the density and then, you know, let, not letting people walk away from a project that, you know, is supposed to have a supermarket. Um, the, to follow up on Councilmember Rivera's question around um, the wage requirements uh, utilizing the FRESH program, just, just give me a short answer. There are no wage requirements outside of minimum wage. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah. uh, that's that's correct. Gotcha. And but if they, the benefit will never be over a million dollars, I assume. But if they do get a million dollars under the current city law, they would be required to pay a living wage. Uh, for um, uh, for projects, you you mean for projects that are receiving more than a million yeah. dollars that they would be in excess of. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, if they uh, if it's covered within the executive order, they would have to pay the living wage. And how many are doing that right now? Are uh, any like, in excess? Um, all, well, all projects have to pay at at least um, living wage, and and most of the we can get back in more. But most of the projects, in terms of average wages, are well above that. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then the um, one other question is, how many projects have opted out of Fresh because they can't, they're not economically viable to date? We haven't received no applications for for sites where they want to opt out of the program. Okay, thanks. And the and so just following up with the points that I know were made earlier in in Manhattan, where I am on the on the east side, on the west side, in the speakers district as well. And I know in northern Manhattan, at least two sites: one in Councilmember Ayala's district, one in Councilmember Levine's, I think Levine's district. Retention has been the issue, really, as not even not even just taking the the, you know, the the retention of the site there, but also you know occasionally uh, a you know just a different usage that is you know chain store or something like that. Um, do we have strategies right now in terms of retention of supermarkets? Certainly, looking at the fresh program about whether it can serve the purpose of supermarket retention as well, serving the similar purpose of access to food, and then similarly other strategies that we have around supermarket retention. 
there's no explicit program through zoning, but there, there may be programs through some of our partner agencies that I, I unfortunately can't speak to, but I can certainly ask them. And Has there been any thought about using Fresh to do retention, expanding it for even discretionary retention? Meaning they not, not a set criteria, but you know, you guys evaluating the viability of and or the need for retention? I mean, the, the, the zoning program generally happens with new development, new development right, but correct. I mean, I certainly, Krishna can tax speak incentives. to that. In terms of um, the tax incentives um, for projects that are in areas that are highly distressed areas, um, we can provide and have provided incentives for projects, for existing supermarkets to make improvements to their store, to make the, to improve layout or buy new equipment to make the stores more um, competitive and continue to be financially viable. Actually, and my last question, because I know I know my chairs have been here for a while. The the plan, the, the fresh program as constituted today. What? Sorry, remind me what year it was started in. Two thousand and nine. Uh, the the well. zoning text was adopted in December two thousand nine. Okay, nine. So probably no supermarket that's taking advantage of the benefit today, or developer really that's taking advantage of the benefit would be in a situation where they are outside of, the, their, the initial lease probably still governs any, any supermarket that's there, because we're, if it's a 10 year lease, we're not at year 10 yet, um, unless it's a short term lease. So, so presumably there will be some that will come to you after, at the end of the lease, or when there's a lease renewal, and will say, it's not economically viable for us, or uh, you know they, they, they will charge a much higher rent than, than, uh, than the market will allow in the specific location. So what are we doing to safeguard that scenario? Because none have come out yet, but I realize that the leases are governing them right now, and the, once the lease is up, we may run into a number that will opt out of the program and have taken advantage of a benefit like new density. Uh, yeah. So, so lease extermination is not a valid reason to opt out of the program. You have to, if, if, you, if a tenant decides to leave voluntarily or involuntarily because of the expiration of a lease, that they, that property owner must occupy that space with another qualifying store in the event that, unlike, we think a rather unlikely event, but certainly not without the realm of possibility that they can't find a store, they would have to demonstrate to us that they've made a good faith effort to market that store to a potential tenant. And we believe that there's, the demand is there. I mean, we're hearing a lot today about the need and we agree that the need is still there. So. Um, you know, this is this is why I said this is an experiment. We it was a modest. Our expectations were modest. There's a desire to see it expand, but for these reasons, you know, we have to sort of think about where is it appropriate and when is it appropriate, and to, to, to balance all of these things so that so that that we aren't trading off bulk and density and, and parking in exchange for a program that doesn't work. But we we're optimistic that it can work and work in more places. I do. Thanks. Th thank you, Council Member. And I uh, want to thank the panel um, for coming in to testify today. Uh, thank you very much. And we are now going to be moving on to the next panel. And I'll turn it over to um, Chair Vallone. Yes, and thank you to the panel for the many questions. And you can see the desire for uh, the expansion and the relooking at the pro project itself from financial and land use. So we thank both of you. So now we have four panels in 56 minutes. So we are going to have to keep this to um, three minutes without embellishing. Otherwise, we'll have some people won't be able to test us. So the first group will, uh, from the National Supermarket Association, Nelson Nusebo, uh, from ASG Associated Supermarket, Michelle Mendoza, uh, Food Industry Alliance, Joe Peltz, uh, Jay Peltz, sorry, and from Western Beef, Danielle Aristi. We thank you all for coming today. We really want to hear from your side. Um, the council members have all expressed the interest to hear on your version of what's, how we can make this better and expand it. Maybe whoever would like to begin, just to identify yourself. Um, good morning. Just make sure your microphone is on there right in front, a little red light. Thank you very much. Good morning all, uh, thank you all for this hearing, especially um, to the chairs, uh, Mr. Vallone and Moya. Congratulations to both of you on your family's academic achievements today. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Danielle Aristi, and I am with Western Beef, and I'm here to share Western Beef's experience with New York City's Fresh program. First, I'd like to provide you with some background information on who Western Beef is. Western Beef is a national grocery store chain founded in 1968 and headquartered in Queens. Across the five boroughs, we employ approximately 2,000 people and have 19 stores. Some might say that before there was fresh, there was Western Beef. Western Beef um, was, has been opening locations in underserved areas and food deserts before anyone else was investing there. Western Beef is proud to be a mission-driven company that strives to provide healthy, affordable food for the people in low-income communities who need it most. Last year, more than a quarter of our transactions occurred with federally funded assistance through EBT. To serve our customers best, our average pricing is 6% 6 lower than our competitors. This spring, our eggs, bread, and chicken were a dollar cheaper per unit. For many of our customers who are living on a median annual income of 45000 for a family of four, every dollar saved counts. 17 of our 19 New York City stores are located in fresh zones. But not all of these locations utilize program benefits, and I will tell you why. The fresh program restrictions, application processes, and red tape often mean that the cost of opting in outweigh the program benefits. We believe strongly in the fresh program and think it was a trailblazer in its first iteration. But since it was created, the companies who use fresh, including Western Beef, have evolved. The city has evolved too. We hope that one day all Western Beef locations can utilize fresh zone benefits and we are excited that the council is exploring enhancements to the program. We are currently pursuing two new locations in the Bronx where the addition of fresh zoning benefits would help us to help the neighborhoods of Marble Hill and Pelham Parkway. When programs like Fresh create a better business environment for our operations, it is not only our customers who benefit, but our employees as well. Western Beef is proud to pay all store employees a living wage, starting at minimum wage. Employees receive a quarterly evaluation and are eligible for a 50 cent raise each quarter. This can add up to between 1,000 and 9,000 extra per year after a couple of years at the store. To be clear, fresh and other city incentives critically enable us to pay these wages and keep good middle class jobs in the five boroughs. We would welcome an opportunity to further discuss our experience with the FRESH program and illuminate several key areas where a streamlined program could produce better results for the companies that use it and for the New Yorkers they ultimately serve. Thank you again for your time and attention today. Danielle, that one sentence was very telling where you have uh, program restrictions, application processes, and red tape often mean the cost of opting in outweigh the program benefits. Yes. And that's what we're trying to address. Okay, we appreciate that. Please, whoever. Hello. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, to the council members, Francisco Moya and council member Peter Vallone and the rest of the council here this afternoon. Thank you for convening this public hearing. My name is Nelson Eusebio. I'm the director of government relations for the National Supermarket Association, the NSA. The NSA is a trade association that represents the interests of independent supermarket owners in New York and other urban, urban areas throughout the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic region, and Florida. In five boroughs alone, we present 400 supermarkets that employ over 15,000 New Yorkers. Today, I'm here to testify about the current structure and impact of FRESH on NSA members. In the past and continuing to today, the New York City Economic Development Council, EDC, has been an influential and important partner for small business of all industries in New York City. All of NSA believe the FRESH program is an incredible step forward to expand economic opportunity for New York supermarkets. The program already has made a significant impact on some supermarkets across the city. However, while the FRESH program is an important initiative, our members have encountered many issues that come from the fundamental structure of the program, which we find make it hard for smaller scale supermarkets to comply. EDC and NSA have long maintained a strong relationship to their credit. They have productively reach out to learn more about our members and way we can better ut utilize the program. However, we continue to revisit this conversation. It occurred to us that the program itself needs revamping. Fresh, applicants, uh, fresh applications are cumbersome, complex, and time-consuming for su most supermarket owners. For those that both own and operate their own stores, 
Little time can be put aside to fill out lengthy and intensive paperwork, not to mention some aspect of the application require a lawyer and accounting. Ultimately, the application process has proven to be overbearing for many supermarkets looking to expand and grow. Most of the current beneficiaries from the Fresh program are large-scale supermarket chains with 20, 10 to 20 stores under their control. Their corporate structures allow them to easily navigate complex application process. NSA members typically own and run their own stores without corporate organization resources. It makes it virtually impossible for small business owners to apply for Fresh. Even so, the structure of this program leans more heavily on benefits for the developers. For instance, increasing floor area and property tax abatement are two key components initiatives. FAR and property tax abatements lean more heavily in favor of developers, while sell tax savings are minor in comparison. We have some ideas how EDC can uh, initiate supermarket owners and therefore increase participation in the program. For example, we think the possibility of rent stabilization or a cap on how much rent could be increased are two options that can be utilized by Fresh to greater help supermarket owners. Uh, we look forward to working with Fresh. We thank the City Council, and we are here not to demolish this program, but to support it and make it easier and more accessible to our members. Thank you, Nelson. Good morning. Or good afternoon, sorry. Um, my name is Michelle Mendoza. I am uh, the Director of Marketing with Associated Supermarket Group. We represent over 250 independent um, stores in, along the Eastern Seaboard, and um, actually many of our members are also NSA members, a significant number of them. The purpose of us being here today is, um, I mean, I think we, we're very clear as what the program stands for and, and, and what it's ultimately to achieve. Um, I think you guys have brought up the point very well that um, it's currently structured so that it's incentivizing the developer and not incentivizing the independent owner who is currently existing and operating doing business in New York. Um, the landscape has changed significantly. Our stores are independently owned and operated, so at a corporate level, um, we provide the, the financing and the resources, the marketing and the government relations as, as what's happening here today. Um, but we need to help them, guide them through the process. And as my peers have said it here today, there's a significant amount of red tape, much of which um, you know they abandoned the application. So it'd be interesting to see how many of them haven't been able to f fulfill the application or even be considered. We have um, two stores that we know of that have qualified for the program. One that is currently live, um, it's an associated in the South Bronx on Webster Avenue. And the other one is Cherry Valley, the one that was spoken to, and that one is actually a new construction. Um, so to go back to the independent owners who are trying to you know, um, stay relevant and stay competitive in the marketplace um, as more chains are coming into the store, I'm gonna give a clear example as to one area in which can be um, focused on, which is the tax part of it. And this is a statement from one of our, our owners currently on the program. It's definitely something to consider the complexity of the program application and the clarity of it. Um, and she goes on to say about the, um, about the information that there's a lot of information and the cost or the barrier of entry in terms of the insurance requirements and so on to be able to be eligible for the program. Uh, but one of their biggest concerns are the, what they are referred to as the pilot payment, pilot payments, which is initially understanding, was, the initial understanding was that the store would be exempt from real estate taxes. Later we learned that the store had to pay pilot payments, which is payment in lieu of taxes, um, which actually turned out to be double what we pay in real estate taxes in a store four blocks away from this one. So it's in the way that it's currently structured. While they may be receiving certain tax advantages, and I don't have the details in terms of how they're structured from their, from their tax perspective, um, they, this is one where it is deficient in not providing the incentives uh, from a tax perspective, which is a significant contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the Refresh Initiative. My name is Jay Peltz, and I'm the General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the Food Industry Alliance of New York. 
FIA is a nonprofit trade association that advocates on behalf of grocery, drug, and convenience stores throughout the state. Neighborhood grocers have never faced a more difficult operating environment. Operating expenses are increasing as rents soar, health insurance premiums rapidly rise, and the minimum rate wage reaches $15 an hour in the city on December 31. Non-traditional food retailers that are largely non-union operators, such as internet sellers, warehouse clubs, natural and organics retailers, and dollar stores, are taking market share from traditional neighborhood grocers. These circumstances are making it increasingly difficult for food retailers to net even a penny on the dollar. In addition, food deserts are present throughout the city. This context makes it clear that neighborhood grocers need help. Unfortunately, despite good intentions, Fresh has not had the anticipated impact. According to the Economic Development Committee, only 13 grocery stores have received financial incentives since the program was launched in 2009. The principal complaint about Fresh is onerous red tape. This creates an insurmountable hurdle for most neighborhood grocers. Lacking the in-house expertise to fully understand the program, they would have to hire outside consultants to assess the program and comply with its requirements. This is typically cost prohibitive to a neighborhood grocer earning about a penny on the dollar. In addition, while the program's tax incentives are helpful, neighborhood grocers are usually starved for capital. Accordingly, grants or low interest rate loans would provide a significant incentive for food retailers to participate in the program. We would like to thank Chairman Vallone and Moya for initiating an effort to revitalize Fresh and therefore deliver a wider assortment of fresh, healthy products to the city's underserved communities. FIA and its members look forward to working with government stakeholders to create better outcomes for the city's residents and its neighborhood grocers under the program. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, I, I think both Chair Moy and I are, along with those other council members, the, the most significant complaint has always continued, goes back to the red tape of the application the fees involved or the hidden fees that are there and the inability of the store owners and the independent store owners to take advantage because it's too cost prohibitive. So those are things that can be addressed. And that's why we're so proud to have this hearing today because it hasn't been talked about before. So there's this program with great intentions that's really not working. So the plan is to get it working and to get these things. So your testimony, we thank you for all coming today because it, it wouldn't work if you weren't here. And we could talk all we want with EDC and IDC, but if we don't have you here, we're not going to learn from that, so we thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I just want to, uh, one, align myself with uh, Chair Ballone, but also to uh, let you know that we will look at some of the suggestions that you made in, in your testimony regarding rent stabilization uh, and how we can put a um, cap on, on the rent increase. Um, you know, in Corona, Jackson Heights, the rents are skyrocketing. It makes it very, very hard for the small independent supermarket owners to really be able to afford one, the application process, and we are seeing how that has created a barrier for most of uh, our community to get involved in this program to the outreach and education um, on letting people know that this program is available uh, has also been something that uh, we have looked at that has been lackluster. So I appreciate your testimony. This is why we have these hearings, is to really get the feedback from folks so how we can Im better improve uh, the programs that we have and are being funded, and especially if programs are now expanding into our communities. Uh, as you saw the list that I read earlier today, uh, this is where people, uh, mostly immigrants, are going to be uh, the ones that will have the benefit of doing this. And, uh, we also don't want to see that this is having the reverse effect of what the intent of this program is and where the developers are the ones that come in and get the bigger benefits uh, and the larger chains uh, are the ones that are able to be able to afford this. So uh, we are going to take a very holistic look at, at, at this process and I think myself and the chair and our colleagues who are here um, are really uh, going to be focusing in on this in the uh, upcoming months. So thank you. Yes. Moya, I, I appreciate your comments, and I can tell you for a fact, most of the stores in your district are our members, and not one of those stores have been able to take advantage of this program. Exactly. Co correct, and that's one of the in in the meetings that I that I had before this hearing uh, is exactly that point that I pointed out. And if we have one store, I think I believe that there is one store in the district, but it's a larger food chain. Um, and so it's, it's Food Bazaar on Junction Boulevard. So they're the ones that have been 
the, the operators in, in taking uh, advantage of this program. But as, as you and I both know, uh, we are the people who rely on our independent supermarkets to do our groceries and uh, the access to quality produce and, and, and products from, from our community. So we want to make sure that we're not hurting the businesses that are there currently. We want to be able to expand and open that up. That, I think, is the intent of this program. Uh, you have given us a lot to uh, consider and really have a thoughtful process in how we go forward on this. And I think that's what we were able to take um, from this hearing and from, from your, your all of your testimony here today. Thank you to the panel. Yeah. Thank you. So our next panel, um, we have three people on this panel. It's going to start with from New York's cent uh, Central Labor C is Alexander Gleason. From Local 338 is Nikki Catterson. And from UFCW Local 1500 is Brandon Sexton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. However you'd like to start. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Gleason, and I am the Director of Policy, Research, and Legislation at the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO. As the umbrella organization for unions across New York City, the Central Labor Council advocates for lifting the floor on wages and standards for all workers in the five boroughs. I am here today to testify on the Food Retail Expansion to Support Health, FRESH program, and how this initiative aimed at eliminating food deserts can be improved to grow the market share of high road jobs. Many New Yorkers are denied access to well-paying jobs, living in neighborhoods without basic services and necessities. This program can, and in some cases has, provided both desperately needed community resource and high road jobs. Established in 2009, the FRESH program has provided incentives to over 20 grocery stores in the city's food deserts the cost per pro project is roughly $5.5 million, and the average tax break has been around $1.4 million per store, which means the city is subsidizing around one quarter of each project. The city's ability to leverage tax subsidies to grow or shrink the market share of well-paying jobs can have additional positive or adverse impacts on a community. The FRESH program has specific requirements on access to fresh food, the square footage of groceries, and other nutritional criteria, but lacks standards around quality or job standards. Why does this matter? Western Beef, one of the few non-union operators, reports to the Economic Development Corporation their wages relative to the living wage law and shows their two stores have only 7% and 16% of workers earning a living wage. All the stores reporting no provision of health benefits to even the full-time workers were non-union. When employers provide pay, low pay and little to no benefits, they are using the public social safety net and the material suffering of their workers to subsidize their bottom line profits at the expense of the taxpayers. It is also very likely many of the workers in the non-union fresh program grocery stores cannot afford the fresh food they sell. There are several ways the FRESH program can be improved to lift the floor on wages and standards for the communities, operators, and workers. The city should consider removing the living wage exemption of this program. That would ensure all recipients of public funding under the program would pay their workers a living wage. The council should also consider the inequality created by online retail, which is entirely inaccessible to the 10% of unbanked, food insecure, low-income people who cannot access the platforms. In addition, the city should consider what other areas are being underserved and which could become so with the closure of one or two existing stores. This could be an incentive to revisit the FRESH program going to the market study published nearly a decade ago. The city could also eliminate the commercial rent tax, which unfairly burdens grocers across every neighborhood of the city. Demanding reciprocity with public dollars gives the city government an opportunity to incentivize high road employment practices. Creating the conditions to grow the market share of well-paying jobs will not only benefit the workers directly, but the community and ultimately the taxpayers. Thank you. You did that very nice.
Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Fresh Incentive Program. My name is Nikki Cateman and I'm here on behalf of Local 338 RWDSU UFCW, a labor union that represents over 13,000 working men and women employed in supermarkets, grocery stores, specialty food stores, retail drug stores, uh, and other industries across New York City, Long Island, the Hudson Valley, and uh, northern New Jersey. Currently, Local 338 represents 7,400 members who live and work in the city of New York, and many of these men and women are employed at over 130 food retail establishments, including Brasidi's, Morton Williams, Stop and Shop, Zabar's, Associated Food Town, and other specialty, uh, small specialty or gourmet shops. The need to access uh, affordable groceries seems to be an issue that's only become more pronounced as small businesses throughout New York City face increasing rents. In 2016, an associated on the west side of Manhattan, which employed local 338 members, was forced to close due to uh, exorbitant rent increases, despite public outcry. This left a huge void for families and seniors who had depended on the store due to convenience to their homes, as well as affordability of groceries sold there. However, this particular store closure, closure only added to an already existing crisis. In 2015, after this supermarket chain, AMP, whose chain brands include Walbaum's Food Basics, Food Emporium, and Pathmark, declared bankruptcy, several dozen stores were liquidated throughout the five boroughs. While most of these locations were purchased and reopened by other grocery operators, many continue to remain dark or have since been acquired by non-food retail companies. Therefore, we should rethink how food deserts are defined. In addition to the city's demographic shifting since the inaugural FRESH program, we have seen the real impact that the closure of just one or two community grocery stores can have on a neighborhood that doesn't traditionally fall in a, a fresh eligible area. Furthermore, how we classified food deserts should take into consideration the impact of online retailers on underserved communities. Online food delivery networks cannot adequately address the needs of low-income families as nearly 10% of them are unbanked. The redefinition also would also present the opportunity for existing brick and mortar grocery operators who are facing both rising rents and increased competition from online retail. For small, most small and mid-sized grocery operators, the margins of profits are narrow and hinder their ability to renovate their stores or expand beyond the neighborhoods they currently serve. In addition to expanding opportunities to qualify for refresh, we would also recommend exempting grocery stores from the commercial rent tax. Food retail establishments are not just sources of fresh produce, meats, and other foods and household items. Grocery stores are sources of, important, of employment, and many companies, like the ones I stated earlier, provide quality jobs that allow workers to support themselves and their families. One of the policy initiatives provided, one of the policy, one of the policy objectives discussed at the origin of the FRESH program was to create jobs and revitalize underserved neighborhoods. While creating jobs is incredibly important, we need to prioritize the goal of creating high road jobs. We would advocate for increase for expanding the uh, living wage to to workers and the to these workers. Um, currently, they are exempted under the living wage law. New York City has a history of recognizing that grocery stores and supermarkets provide crucial public benefits in terms of not just access to goods that promote public health, but also to quality local jobs. This reflects in the fact that since the program began in 2010, an average of three stores per year have opened in food deserts throughout the five boroughs. While the FRESH program has made progress over the last decade, we must address the changes that are happening both within the city of New York and the food retail industry. There is room to further support traditional brick and mortar grocery stores and supermarkets who are long established in these neighborhoods. However, we are, cannot leave behind the men and women who are working in this industry. We have the responsibility to ensure that those employed in these establishments can in turn access the fresh foods we are advocating for. On behalf of Local 338, I look forward to having further discussions on we can promote responsible grocery and retailers. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Vallone. Chairman Moya, thank you so much for having us today. Your, your time is up. Thank you. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just have kidding. a good night. Just remember who did kidding. that to you. Sorry, I took your time. <laughs> yeah, she took my time. But I'm not going to go three minutes. Uh, Take your time. I'm just kidding. Take your time. My name is Brendan Sykes. I'm the Director of Organizing and Political Coordinator for UFCW Local 1500. And I'm giving testimony today on behalf of Anthony Spielman, President of UFCW 1500. With over 19,000 members, Local 1500 is one of the largest locals in the UFCW and the largest in New York State. Our union represents men and women in Queens, Staten Island, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, along with many in Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess counties. Our members work for companies that have a long history in New York City. These companies, such as Stop and Shop, Fairway, King Cullen, ShopRite, D'Agostino's, Gristides, and the workers at the Helen Hardy Commissary have been serving New Yorkers for many years. Our members receive better salaries, 
and better benefits because of the hard work Local 1500 has done in negotiating on their behalf. UFCW Local 1500 has been at the forefront to push policy so low income areas have the same access as the more affluent. As with any policy that doles out tax exemptions, subsidies, or tax breaks, we demand that the jobs created are well paid and compensated. Our philosophy is every community deserves good food, good jobs, and good health. Fresh is designed to create an environment for supermarkets to open in food deserts and be stable partners in the community. Having permanent access to healthy, fresh food is vital to any community. We, we applaud the understanding and desire to address this. We implore you to also think of the permanent jobs left behind and the operators that are receiving taxpayers' money. Our members receive middle class benefit packages and wages, paid time off, health coverage, and, and a pension so they can retire in dignity. They have fought hard to maintain and strive for these better benefits, and we want to make sure that operators that recognize the workers seated at the table are also recognized. Along with our sister locals, we have developed a quick guide to recognizing your local high road retailer. What is a high road retailer? We define them as companies who have three simple principles as their mission statement. Be good community partners, have a strong environmental record, and invest in their greatest asset, their workers, by paying living wages, stable schedules, full-time hours, training, career advancement, and the freedom to form a union. The communities that are considered food deserts often lack the accessibility of economic advancement. And often there are those that change the laws for gain and furthering their needs. And this is not the case here. By prioritizing high road retailers, the city can ensure that communities are receiving both good food and good jobs. Without these two, we cannot have healthy communities across the city. Thank you. Thank you, and to the tens of thousands of members that you all represent. These hearings are so important to hear how we preserve these companies and these workers and to, to make this right. Because it, it's, it's close, but it's just not there. The idea was uh, something that we all kind of embraced, but it didn't work. Like it's even 22, 22 stores have, have, have succeeded in 10 years over this is the reason why we're having the hearing and, and all aspects of this has to be re-looked at. And so we thank you so much for your testimony and who you represent. Thank, and thank you again. I think this is um, opening uh, the door for us to really start exploring uh, what has been working with this program and what hasn't been working with this program. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, not only are we treating the communities right, but also the workers that live in the community and work in these, in these supermarkets uh, all have uh, the right benefits for them to uh, continue to thrive in the community and, and make this happen. So I think for us, um, we have our, our homework ahead of us uh, to, to continue to look at how we can make those improvements. Your testimony is critical uh, in how we are able to shape uh, the future of uh, FRESH. So thank you so much for, for your time and your testimony. And to all of your uh, workers who do a great job um, helping us uh, here in the city. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So our next panel, it will be uh, from the American Cancer Society's Michael Devoli, from the American Heart Association, Robin Vitale, from the Cooperative Economic Alliance of New York, Evie Zavidal, and ANHD, Armando Chapilikin. And then there's one more panel after this. So for the guys, just to let you know, so Craig, Tiver, Dan, and Dan, two Dan's. We are on the next panel. So we have two. Maybe we want to do. We want to add Craig William from CUNY. You want to come on up to this panel? Sure. <laughs> Checking on the Peru shirt there, I'm on. <laughs> Seventy-six minute, still down one. <laughs> we are we are watching in pain with you. The Not scores, that we're watching. It's scores, just the scores are popping up. All right, so, sure. Uh, uh, good morning. My name is Michael Devoy. I am the director of government relations for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Good afternoon. I'm going to keep this sort of very brief. Um, uh, the American Cancer Society, we are uh, directly uh, concerned about healthy eating uh, and affordable healthy eating in New York City uh, due to the direct link between cancer and obesity. Um, we are you know, here today to express our support for the FRESH program and just our support for the Council's efforts to improve this program, 
but also to call attention to the broader need to address healthy eating uh, and active living in New York City. Um, I've submitted testimony there uh, for you today that goes into depth. I want to just call attention to one very specific detail. Uh, studies from the Department of Health, when you look at the community health surveys, showed that nearly 13 or over 13 percent of all New Yorkers don't eat fruit or vegetables. And when you go into many parts of the city, including parts of the Bronx, including parts of central Brooklyn, it's over 25 percent of adults do not eat fruits and vegetables, according to the Community Health Survey. And unfortunately, that is not a problem that's going to be solved just by looking at the grocery stores and our supermarkets. We do need to look at the significant importance that they play, but we cannot ignore the important role that our corner stores and our bodegas all across the city. They are often the lifeline for our communities. And so um, we are not experts on the FRESH program, and we are learning about this as we go along, and we are here to express our support and to work with you and to work with the supermarkets to expand this program. But we also ask the council to look very closely at ways that we can expand uh, fruit and vegetable access and affordability in many of the sort of corner stores and bodegas across the city. There are a lot of different ways that we can do that through financing programs to allow for their expansion, financing programs to make it easier for them to actually keep fruit and vegetables uh, on, our, on our shelves. But additionally, we need the city to look at programs that make it simply affordable for people to actually go purchase fruit and vegetables, expanding the SNAP program, educating more New Yorkers about the SNAP program. It's astonishing to me how many people do not realize that that match exists. I had a very conversation yesterday afternoon with, a ch with the caregiver who takes care of my four-month-old, and she didn't realize that the match existed. So there's a lot that we can do, and I am absolutely thrilled that the council is looking at this. One last thing I just want to mention is that while we are talking about zoning to incentivize groceries and healthy food options, we also need to take a serious look at ways to discourage the unhealthy options that are all across our city. We have way too many fast food restaurants. We have, do not have enough grocery stores. We do not have fresh, enough fresh fruit and vegetables. Thank, Thank you. you. One of the issues that we see with FRESH is that we believe that the underlying theory of the program is flawed. When FRESH was designed, a common belief was that increasing the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables would nudge residents to eat healthier. More recently, however, studies have shown that the relationship between the access and diet is more complex. Residents may appreciate having new or renovated supermarkets in their neighborhood, but there is little evidence of significantly changed shopping behavior or nutritional health. What we want to ask is how can the City Council address these limitations of the Fresh, Fresh Program? And we suggest the following six strategies. Number one, identify food access needs through community planning, not area-wide indices. Community-based food retail planning would be a more effective strategy for locating fresh projects than the current area-wide, excuse me, area-wide designation. While the ULERP process allows for public input into zoning processes, Proactive planning would engage residents in discussing the types of food retail needed in their neighborhood, potential sites, and new and expanded retail options and strategies to attract food retailers to those sites and to encourage existing food retailers to expand. Number two, focus on the availability of affordable healthy foods, not square feet of retail space. The FRESH program is designed to increase the square feet of supermarket space per capita Yet the size of a supermarket is not related to the quality, value, healthfulness, or appeal of products for sale, and thus is not a meaningful indicator of access. Number three, move beyond traditional supermarkets to support other healthy food purveyors. The reliance of, on supermarkets and other large retailers as an indicator of access also underestimates the availability of healthy foods sold by other types of retailers. Small grocers like fruit and vegetable stores in ethnic markets or farmer's market may better meet the needs of the community than conventional supermarkets. Number four, address food gentrification to protect remaining supermarkets. 
The FRESH program remains focused on supermarkets while the entire food retail sector is being transformed. FRESH will become less and less relevant if it does not take the impact of food gentrification into account. The continued shift to club chains and mass merchandise stores like Target and to chains that appeal to younger, more affluent consumers, such as Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, has also hurt conventional supermarkets. Not only are these types of food retailers appealing to different types of shoppers, they're opening in different neighborhoods than the stores that are closing. Number five, prioritize the needs of NYCHA residents. With approximately 400,000 low-income residents with significant disparities in diet-related diseases, improving food access and NYCHA development should be a count the council's highest priority. But rather than simply trying to offer incentives to conventional supermarkets to locate near NYCHA, an innovative food access strategy would involve residents in identifying the solutions. And lastly, focus on upstream interventions. Ultimately, food access comes from having sufficient income to pay for food. The City Council should consider policies that increase income as food access policies. These include higher minimum wage, truly affordable housing, access to affordable health care and child care, reducing transportation costs, and increasing the number of eligible New Yorkers who take advantage of public, public food assistance benefits. Our institute has consulted with council staff on a variety of issues related to access and policy support neighborhood supermarkets, and we would welcome the opportunity to work in partnership with the council to analyze and assess food access to support these six recommendations. Thank you. Consider this an open invitation to work with us because those are all wonderful ideas. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, chairs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Armando Moritz Terpelican. I am the campaign coordinator for equitable economic development at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, also known as ANHD. ANHD is a membership organization of neighborhood-based community groups across the, from across the five boroughs. We have, a hundred, we have over 100 member organizations throughout the five boroughs, and our mission is to ensure flourishing neighborhoods and decent affordable housing for all New Yorkers. We broadly support the council's review and efforts to review the FRESH program. Uh, I'm going to try to pull some parts from my written testimony because there is a lot here and I only have three minutes. Um, but I do want to touch on some of the points that were brought up throughout um, earlier testimony as well as some of the questions that other council members had brought up. Um, but for the purposes of time, I'll be zooming in specifically on the eligibility requirements, the zoning incentives, and the impact that the program has currently had on broader city policy. Um, so specifically, I think what is interesting in the council's consideration of expanding out the fresh boundaries is that we want more, more uh, development and we want more food grocers to be taken advantage of this program. However, one of the things that struck me about the existing FRESH program is the fact that the eligibility requirements aren't even consistent between the financial incentives or the zoning incentives. If you want to tap into the zoning incentives, you need to meet a minimum of 6,000 square feet of retail space for a general line of food and non-food grocery products. Whereas if you want the financial benefits, you need 5,000 square feet. Why not have it be consistent across the board as one recommendation? The second point that I would also make is if we're going to be really talking about access to healthy food, that doesn't necessarily have to come through supermarkets, but if we're going to be looking at smaller grocery stores, the threshold of 5,000 or 6,000 square feet is way too high for a lot of existing food retailers that are already in neighborhoods that provide healthy food to communities. So part of, out of a lot of the conversation from the hearing this morning, if I'm, I'm a bit unclear in terms of even what the goal of the FRESH program specifically is because I've heard two very distinct arguments so, so far from the administration. One is to create access to affordable and healthy food, but then the other side of it is specifically looking at the development of supermarkets. And those two things are not necessarily always the same thing. So I think in terms of thinking about how to reform the FRESH program, we need to think about how we could potentially tweak the eligibility requirements to make it more accessible for smaller food retailers. Focusing now on the zoning incentives, one of the things that I specifically want to jump or, or point out is um, just pulling from some of the language that's available online, that there are additional development rights that are triggered, specifically the quote, one additional square foot of area in mixed residential development and, com and commercial buildings for every square foot provided for a grocery store up to a 20,000 square foot limit. Um, that's encouraging greater development in areas where the zoning incentives are available specifically. However, there are areas that are currently mapped in the, in the fresh map, uh, like in Hunts Point, Port Morris, and East New York, uh, which are all industrial business zones and have already been identified by the city as core industrial neighborhoods in the city. So while the city has an existing policy separately as part of its industrial action plan that limits residential development in the IBZs, 
parts of Fresh are actually actively encouraging mixed-use development, which includes residential, in those same neighborhoods. So I feel like that discrepancy needs to be addressed if we're going to have a solid strategy on how to provide healthy food to neighborhoods across the city. Thank you. It, it may be beyond the existing parameters of the Fresh program to do all of these things that we're talking exactly. about. And I think that's things that the Chair Mori and I and all the council members were told. We may have to even go beyond and look at subdivisions of the program or new programs to exist to preserve the existing supermarkets that we have. It doesn't matter about the square foot. It turns on the actual food provider that's there, critical to that neighborhood, what type of financial incentives to help that lessee operator owner of that program to preserve their workers and the food that's there versus somebody looking at a brand new development and us trying to make sure we bring in or create a new food uh, establishment that didn't exist, yep. layering NYCHA to give them the zoning abilities to act. They don't even have the ability to do it now. Yep. So what we want to do is just give NYCHA that ability mm -hmm. to remove it from the argument. Have the ability to put whatever type of food, supermarket, produce that you that particular NYCHA development needs. Right now they don't have that. So there's all these greats stemming from the conversation, but it, it may not actually come from the fresh itself, but, but, but streamlining the application process, removing those fees, the owners and process it, that they're going through is, is, is things we can definitely address in the, in the immediate future and then looking at some of these other goals that you've addressed today or, or might be even it, separate programs. And if I may just really quickly, I think that actually is, is entirely the point here because I think that the way that fresh has been crafted is that it is specifically a development strategy for new development but there is, as, as you pointed out, and as numerous council members have pointed out, nothing really here in this plan or in this program to support existing food retailers that are struggling to continue to serve their neighborhoods. And I think that that's, that's, that's going to open up a whole other conversation because everybody knows that commercial tenants in general are facing a displacement crisis in the city right now. Nor do we even want to unintentionally create them as a target for a future development to say, hey, we can take this and make it bigger and do all this for the incentives. That's, that's not the goal either. So. Uh, and that's why this is so important. And um, Councilmember Moyer and, and Richards, who are working on this, for us, this is the first time that anyone's brought this up. So when we were appreciative that EDC and IDC is starting the conversation, but so much more. And if not, then we'll take the next step with, with the powers that the council can do also. So any other closing remarks, Chair Moyer? I, I just want to thank the panel for your insightful testimony. actually two testimony. more people. Oh, we, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I well, didn't thank you for, for your insightful uh, testimony today. Uh, you know, this helps us, as Councilmember Vallone said, is take this feedback and, and help us as we go and, and, and develop what we're looking to do uh, with this program in the future. And you did bring up SNAP, which is a very important uh, program for us here at the Council as well, which, you know, we have been fighting for for many years, um, and, and the programs that we'd like to keep in the budget. So uh, thank you for, for, for that as well. Thank you. Our, our last two for today is uh, TEG. Teg Singh Sethi from Cypress Hills and Dan Rad from the Razin Development. Good afternoon, gentlemen. If you like, whoever would like to start first. Hello. Okay. Hi. I'm Teg. I work for the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. Uh, it's a community-based nonprofit in East New York and Cypress Hills, operating in Community Board 5. As a pretty wide breadth nonprofit, and I won't go through everything we do, but one of the things we do is we develop affordable housing and have a Verde program where we focus on healthy living and healthy food. Um, so we built a project called Pitkin Barriman. It's located at the intersection of Pitkin and Barriman, 2501 Pitkin Avenue. It is a 60 unit deeply affordable Ella affordable housing deal with a 7,200 square foot grocery store below as well as 3,200 square feet of storage and a small retail yard for mechanicals. We pursued and achieved a fresh tax abatement through this program, and I believe we were the first fresh deal where the developer received the incentive so that if a grocery store were to leave or be swapped out, that the incentive would stay. Um, the history of this site is that it was a rezoning, and part of that rezoning was a commitment to the community which had asked during the rezoning process for fresh food in the neighborhood. 
There's a significant number of grocery stores north of Atlantic Avenue and Cypress Hills. However, south of Atlantic Avenue, there's a, a dearth. And around this site in particular, there is one grocery store a couple, about a quarter of a mile away. But other than that, everything is a subway right away. And there is a huge number of bodegas. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the process was like for us, where our pain points were, and also what good came out of it as well. The first thing I would say is that the staff at the IDA was extremely committed to the project and bent over backwards in some ways to help make this happen due to the fact that this project was very much in the spirit of Fresh, a low-income neighborhood where fresh food was desperately needed, high incidences of health issues, and a high level of fast food. Um, however, and, and so I have to compliment the IDA staff on doing so. The, pain points for us were definitely the fees. I don't think that the fees are completely outrageous depending on the situation. Perhaps for owner operators it may make sense where you're reaping the benefit directly. Um, however, for a community-based nonprofit that was actually acting in the spirit of Fresh, these fees were in a lot of ways counterintuitive. We were not intending to pass them on to the grocer because the goal here was to maximize the, our ability to attract a grocer that had the community-mindedness that we needed to actually achieve the goals that we're talking about with the program. Oh, I'm almost done. The other parts are more specific and I can talk about them more. Our greatest recommendations would be to exempt nonprofit from nonprofits from fees. I can't speak to the other situations. Uh, some more understanding of affordable housing with regards to the selection of outside counsel throughout the process. That was a huge challenge for us. And I think the big missing piece here is that just building it and they will come may not be enough. That part of requiring this shouldn't just be higher NYC, but it should also be funding and ensuring that these organizations who are achieving the fresh benefit work with nonprofits like Cypress Hills or like City Harvest that are gonna provide the services to help people actually use this fresh food to actually achieve the better health benefits. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Chairman Vallone, Chairman Moya, how are you? Uh, I'm Daniel Rad, Radson Development. We're an affordable housing developer here in New York City. I came to share about a project that we did in uh, Harlem. It's the first uh, fresh supermarket in Harlem. Um, uh, it's on 140th Street and 8th Avenue. It's 8,000 square feet at grade and 4,000 square feet below grade. Um, so uh, I know we're short on time, so I'll just come to the points that I came to make. Um, the DCP process was very long and onerous. Uh, it's something an affordable housing developer is accustomed to, but it, it is definitely a deterrent for other developers who are not accustomed to that type of scrutiny of plans. The, um, at the time of our development, the, uh, the benefit for the tax abatement was not available to owners. Uh, it was only derived through uh, the tenant, and that, that also became a loss for our project. We were not able to convince our tenant to uh, apply because of the fee. Um, so, I mean, we did apply for an ICAP, but unfortunately that, that didn't work for our project. Um, the zoning bonus, however, was, was very beneficial to our project. It actually enabled us to make an affordable housing project. We, we were able to get above 50 units by taking advantage of the fresh bonus. Um, so one of the suggestions I'd like to make is potentially an increased bonus for affordable housing developers. Uh, because in our case, we were able to uh, make an affordable development that otherwise would not have been able to happen. Um, the uh, uh, I've heard other testimony. I've heard other testimonies. The the general size requirements I, I think should definitely be revisited because uh, the way that supermarkets are operating is a little more fluid these days. Uh, sizes is, is becoming more and more uh, constricted because they need to compete with all different kinds of markets. So having the large large you know 20, 20 thousand square foot markets are not they're not surviving anymore we have several that that went under in the past five years and other properties um, so whatever you can do to encourage smaller smaller markets would be would be wonderful um, uh, then 
what we also wanted to share was that um, the uh, zoning bonus, when you're taking it, uh, there's a height. There's also an additional height. Uh, once you go for the additional height, it's 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 no longer uh, discretionary. It has to go through a full uh, review by DCP and and the council. So it, there should hopefully be a way to encourage the use of the height without. You know, because when uh, one thing to have in mind is when you're trying to bring a grocery, even a, a for-profit developer trying to bring a, a, a fresh supermarket into a development, it's uh, it's a it's a drag on the on the performance of the property. So, um, however, you can take that into consideration to help the process with DCP, so that if the height is needed to make it happen, it shouldn't be at a further negotiation to the project. Well, we um, think. We and thank you for that, because especially the affordable housing components and the conversation of it with, in today's tenants. Uh, definitely, Councilmember Lanceman is present as he's about to start his next year. <laughs> so we conclude with that. Uh, we thank you for today's joint hearing, for everyone who participated. Uh, have a great afternoon.